Institute and agency medicine and healthcare program combines theoretical knowledge and practical experience to prepare leaders for tomorrow. We have a different streams in the Zambia campus also. We have public health management programs, nursing, international information technology, and other health allied sciences in both masters, doctoral, as well as bachelor program. On behalf of Texela International Conference, we thank our beloved partners, Texela International Journal, Confiogo, Blue Crest University College, Indian Journal of Scientific Research, Journal of Pharmacovigilance and Drug Research. Before I conclude, dear all participants, I want to share a few operating instructions for the to follow. All participants should check your speaker settings to make sure the presentation is audible. Those who are making presentation, please enable your mic from the toolbar at the top and share your webcam by clicking on the start webcam on the sidebar. At the end of each presentation, there will be a Q&A session for 10 minutes wherein you can post your questions and it will be answered. So I may request the first presenter, Mr. John Mozundo, on the topic, Private Gender Practitioners Agreement on Skills and Competencies for Universal Health Coverage in Urban South Africa, a descriptive, descriptive cross-sectional survey. I may request John to talk something so that I can check the audible here. Voice. Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much, Mr. John. Can you share your screen so that I can confirm that too? Yes, please. Screen is sharing now. Yes, I got the screen. Your presentation, please. Yeah, just a minute. Okay. Let me want I may need to choose from here. Let's go to this. Okay, click on slide show button so that the screen will be enlarged and it will be visible for everyone. Okay, very good, uh, Mr. John. You can proceed. Yes, my name is uh, Dr. John Musonda. I'm a family medicine physician and also a faculty member of the University of Vatastrand, Department of Family Medicine and Primary Health Care. I'm involved in supervising undergraduate and postgraduate uh, family medicine. I'm also quite active with hospital management as hospital direct director across the six uh, hospitals I'm looking after and uh, uh, coordinating the clinic district clinical specialist team, as well as I'm um, the COVID-19 vaccination lead for the district. Currently, just about to complete my PhD with Texla. I'm privileged this morning to share us, uh, a mini study with you. This, this mini study is part of the bigger study for my PhD, which looked at uh, the, uh, exploring the development of uh, family medicine uh, in readiness for the universal health coverage for urban South Africa. And in that, in that whole thesis, there are a few studies, and this is one of those, one of the many studies. Um, you can see that investments in a stronger health system to promote and protect uh, economies, it protects businesses, protects peace, protects livelihood, sustainability, 
general equity and promotes the environment, promotes the education, and many more. Um, I will first start with the nomenclature that the general practice, if you say general practitioner, there are two forms of them. There are those who are general practitioners and working in the public sector, and also general practitioners who work in private sector. I think every country in the, in, uh, in, uh, on the continent, as well as in the world, has got a private sector aspect to it. In, most, in other economies, these are blended and uh, managed together. In other, in other countries, these are quite separate. In South Africa, as the case, the private sector and the public sector are quite uh, distinct. You know, they are, they, are, they are separate. And therefore, our study looked at the uh, uh, focus, in this case, this mini study focused on the private general practitioners. I will first, uh, in terms of nomenclature, the World Conference on Family Physicians of 2018, Rustenburg, South Africa, uh, did uh, define who a general practitioner is and a, and a family doctor and a family physician. A general practitioner is the, in, a, in our context in South Africa is somebody who's completed the medical training and goes into private practice. So it becomes a private general practitioner. Those who just completed the medical training and joined the, the government and work as a generalist, meaning uh, rotating in all disciplines of medicine, of clinical medicine, those are called the public general practitioners. And the, they are also called the uh, family doctors in our context. But also in other parts of the world, if you talk about, uh, and then a family physician in South Africa, is somebody who's done four years training to become a family physician, is the real expert in primary health care. And the, those also are, uh, uh, family physicians, the virtue of their training. They do general practice work, but at a much more advanced level because of the additional qualifications. So in this context, then we are looking at the general private, uh, general, uh, private general practitioners who are not, who are not uh, uh, trained. But in our survey, we also included the, the family physicians who are in private practice so that the understanding is, is clear. All right, so the uh, globally uh, sustainable development goals and universal health coverage are premised to ensure equity and quality health care. Uh, in South Africa, national health insurance is the intended vehicle to achieve the health care, uh, the universal health care. Uh, re remember that the, uh, this uh, de development goals uh, development goes 2030, you know, the um, goal three talks about, uh, you know, issues of health coverage and, uh, and then, he, then he, um, and also alludes, alludes, alludes to the fact that there should be universal health coverage in order to protect uh, people's finances and uh, ensure there is equity in health care. So when you talk about the uh, universal health coverage in our, in our setup and the, the, uh, the national health insurance in this aspect, because in South Africa, we, 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 our tool for achieving a national, uh, universal health coverage is through national health insurance. And with it, the strategy is that uh, we are going to, to purchase services and by contracting general practitioners. That is key in that we need to identify where these general practitioners are in the community and we need to purchase, strategically purchase their services, which could then be paid for in a, in a central pool. And with that, the skills training will prepare GPs. However, we do not, it is not clear yet which GP skills and competences are currently in, in practice. So in a readiness for the NHI, it would be prudent to look at which skills are, are currently there and where gaps may exist. So then the study assessed the GP's agreement on the core clinical skills and competences in urban South Africa and readiness for the NHI. When we talk about clinical skills, we, we talk of uh, the, the easiest way to understand it is we are talking about procedures, clinical procedures. 
these could be examinations or, or special procedures which are done. And when we talk about competences, we're really talking about the scope, the scope of practice. And there are key elements we look at under competences as well as the clinical uh, skills. Um, yeah, so then the, in the, in the, as, a, as a summary, we, this was a descriptive cross-sectional study which used the online semi-structured survey, uh, which from 3rd September to 14 October, we targeted the 5,212 5, 5, private uh, GPs registered on many pages in Houghton, South Africa. After a simple randomization, we, we managed to, to invite about 2,780 to the online, to the online uh, survey. Uh, remember the context of this is that uh, this happened at the height of the COVID when most of us were actually indoors. And we took it as an opportunity to, to send out a survey so that when people were at home, they could probably, the GPs were at home, uh, their practices were quite, were almost closed. Most of them were closed. They were trying to learn to do tele, uh, teleconsulting and telemedicine, but uh, it was not that developed. So it was at that height that we did that. Uh, in, a, in a private sector provides a large share of health services available in any country. The general practitioners then constitute in most in most institutions they constitute about ten percent of medical pro, uh, medical profession worldwide, and uh, it's very useful. They, are, they normally congregate in urban areas and provide many curative services because they are private they are practitioners. Their services are available to those who can pay. Uh, that's why they are, pri they are in private, uh, payment becomes an issue. And often it is not very organized. And uh, some statutory bodies, they regulate private uh, uh, medical practitioners. Yeah, they should, uh, almost all statutory bodies across the world, they, they try to regulate private practice, but uh, that is what it is. It's about uh, payment and if you don't if you can't pay then you can't use them so access is an issue so under universal health coverage we want them to be part of the solution and uh, again the we use the four a four point like scale which uh, which was categorized into we had the strongly agree agree strongly disagree disagree and then we aggregated this the or categorized them as agree and disagree when we were analyzing a wide chi-square test evaluated associations between variables. We found majority agreed to skills such as the eye, ear, nose, and throat skills. And the least agreed was the abdominal skill. All competences were generally agreeable in the excess of 80%. Uh, logistic regression, short qualification, work experience, and type of practice were significant predictors of agreement. Uh, this is important, but the conclusion, GPs did not agree to listed skills. Significant predictors of agreement were assessed and, and identified. Findings highlight the need to first track GP training readiness for NHI in South Africa, and we could uh, actually extend this to elsewhere where the NHI is being implemented. So the learning needs survey started the learning needs survey and the two national uh, workshop uh, stakeholder workshops were conducted the, in South Africa in 2016 to align uh, all diplomas and design a national diploma for South Africa because of the NHI and the uh, universities the uh, emergence of the NHI universities came together and said let's try and uh, develop a national di diploma for family medicine and the, which subsequently identified the roles and competences for primary care uh, doctors. It was envisaged that under the NHI, majority of primary care doctors, who are the GPs, who provide private GPs, especially in the urban environment. While rural needs were important, the urban settings would be increasingly greater and more of the norm. We, with, because of this uh, rural urban movement or migration, we still think a lot of people would be, would be even with the NHI, 
if we do not do deliberate effort to to look at it, a lot of rural people will be coming to hospital and you find to, to urban areas and find the GPs will be more overwhelmed there. Private GPs may be disinclined to do a course that may perceive and suited to the needs of an, an urban setting. So because we, uh, we want to know what skills are at present there, so that when we do design a course, it would do, it would be what they would be expecting to use, they would find it useful. So what we already knew was that the implementation of universal health coverage required strengthening of primary health care through GP skills. So that is from literature, we, we knew that we need GP skills to be up to the scratch in order for the primary health care to be strengthened. And the, we also know that there was a consensus on co-clinical skills which were listed in the learning outcomes for the family medicine diploma. So we had achieved the, the consensus list of learning outcomes, which are the skills and the competences so we, we, we then uh, the prelude, Milan, prelude to the above, Milan uh, conducted a study in 2015 in South Africa to evaluate the self-reported learning needs of primary healthcare doctors among 30 guidelines, 85 skills and 12 roles. Uh, this document is what formed the basis of our tool. It, it was the, the 30 national guidelines Yeah, the 30 national guidelines and they identified the and they identified 85 skills and 12 roles were used and adapted to develop a, a list which we we use to evaluate the current practice for the private general practitioners. In this study, it was a descriptive study which they conducted with a companion sampling of 170 private GPs and medical officers from eight provinces in South Africa. Then. The, the 170 private GPs were invited specifically across the country to come to Pretoria, head office of South, uh, headquarters of South Africa, to come and uh, be oriented on the uh, national health insurance and the, and the such aspects, because the contracting of general practitioners uh, first needed to share that kind of information. So then the uh, Malan and the team, they used this opportunity to survey uh, those who had come and they then came up compared with the previous study, the previous studies which were done about, and the workshops of stakeholders to identify what will be on the list of the national outcomes in the diploma for South Africa in family medicine. So then uh, what is the issue? Private GPs, are seen to function suboptimally in the private sector in South Africa. Uh, we say this because it's evident from reports in the press. It's evident from uh, from the, the other forms of media, social media, and all that. And the, the functions of Baltimore, the yet the country faces the quadruple burden of disease. We still have uh, a high prevalence of HIV and AIDS and TB high maternal and child mortality, non-communicable diseases, violence and injuries that constitute the public mandate for care. This is where most of the public purse is spent. When you look at injuries alone, in South Africa, every, every holiday, Christmas, Easter, and such kind of holiday, you've got over a thousand mortalities and road traffic accidents. You know, the it's it's just causes so much burden on the public finance, and uh, with all this background in mind, we need then to see, to know uh, how to handle the issue of GPs performing suboptimally because the the context is one of very is a very complicated one. So despite the the knowledge gap, there is currently no training uh, pipeline adequate to meet the private GP needs for the new system new health system. Here, what we are saying is that the, the mandate in terms of the GP training is, is still up to now optional. Uh, the diploma course, the national diploma course, which is there, which should really be a bridge between uh, being trained and not trained, between a, um, a general practitioner who just come out from medical school uh, to a family physician who's been trained. 
So there is no formalized way of engaging OGPs to undertake that training. So then the NHI itself could then be used as a potential springboard to address that gap by accelerating skills acquisition. Um, purpose of to evaluate was to evaluate GP's agreement on co-clinical skills and competencies in the current practice as listed in the national um, in the national document on the family medicine diploma in South Africa. The aim was to, to assess private uh, uh, GP's agreement to co-clinical skills and the objectives were to describe these, the social demographics, agreement on skills and associations between skills and demographics. Then we undertake a descriptive cross-section online survey at the, at the height of COVID in a, a, you know, and then we also use the using many pages database. We targeted 5,212 registered GPs. Many pages database is a is a database where all general practitioners and the and the specialists of different types are registered across Africa. So that if you are if you want to if you want to they, they keep that kind of database about their contacts and the and, and qualifications and so on. So that is a very big resource in terms of research. You know, it's a med pages database. So from there, we worked with the, with them and the, obviously they needed the, to pay fees and the needed certain regulations to be met. Then we, they, they managed to not manage, they, they assisted to sample using a, a simple randomization, they managed to to invite you on behalf of the researchers 2,780. We prepared all the documentations in terms of consent, research, the questionnaire itself, as well as the, all the relevant information and the and approvals and the uh, ethical approvals and so on. So we, we then surveyed this 2,780 between 6 September and 14 October 2020, we emailed the questionnaire, consent form, and, and they developed a survey platform. We needed a platform for us. There are different platforms available. You know, you can use the uh, red dot. You can, if, if, if you want, you can use that. Or you can use the other forms of surveys. But in our case, we used the survey monkey, uh, which we found quite useful to analyze the things on the spot as we went on. And the tool we used to develop the questionnaire was an validated one uh, used, as I said, in the area study uh, by Melan and the team. Uh, respondents who completed the questionnaire in full, we do not uh, want people just uh, responded, but uh, gave us the, didn't sign the consent, they just clicked through and all that. Those we sort of uh, took them out. There are those who, who, who signed the consent and started doing the questionnaire, which are the 25, 20 or so questions, 25 questions, and took semi-structured, took about uh, yeah, just under five minutes to do. You could do it on your phone or you can do it on your laptop. So it was actually quite uh, useful to use. So then uh, we saw that about 162 did uh, uh, consent and they started completing the questionnaire but they did not complete it in full. So we took, him, we took them out and conveniently worked with what was the, those which were full completed questionnaires. A four point Lackett scale was categorized, as I said, from agree and disagree. A word square was used. All the ratios with a 95% confidence interval and p-value of 0 0.05 were considered significant. Ethical considerations that was obtained from University of Vitvata Strand, um, Human Research Ethics Committee and four District Research Ethics Committee in Houghton. The, the many pages made sure that they invited private uh, practitioners from across Houghton. So the, the simple randomization meant that they had to match regions and the numbers of general practitioners from there who were to be invited. And uh, proportionally, de proportionately, depending on uh, how heavy the, the region was, Outing has about five regions or health districts. 
And the, those the heavier ones, we invited more GPs than in those which were less, less heavy. You know, and the, the reference number was M, um, with the medical, I think, medical research, 18111 quite triple one five. Quadruple one five. And then the national research database number was also GP 2019-0302 and one in brackets. Before you, the, just to obtain ethical approvals here, it, it was a total order in that uh, out of those regions, four of them are the district health ethics committees, where we also needed to get a separate ethical approval before the university could approve, actually. You know, and then we also had the, the national one where we also registered and got that number. So it's also in the national database. So this administrative work was uh, was quite uh, time consuming and in needed space. Results, uh, bit, quite a bit slide there, but uh, we probably can see table one, social demographics. The mean age of, res of respondents was 49.5 years. And the respondents were aged between 27 and 79 years old. Imagine we still have, um, yeah, we still have 79 years old who are in, in full practice. And the males were 53 and, the, and they were white. Those, that, those were the typical participant. This was the typical participant. It was a white person who was a male uh, between that age and the mean was 49.5. You can see that uh, maybe it can tell you more in terms of culture and all that. The majority of the doctors in the country are uh, actually black black doctors. Do you know what your but customers are saying about you on Facebook? That, Have you they, seen how your competition is using they, Instagram in their new marketing they, they campaigns? Are you answering product questions from prospects did, on Twitter? You know, or maybe the reverse is true. No one is talking nine, about your company on social at all. How do you even know? You know by developing your social listening and monitoring um, skills. Social no, monitoring no. and social yeah, so listening the, on your platforms is, is very you know, important. The, it is a journey that we have been embarking on because we want to know or, uh, what our audience is thinking, what is important uh, to them. Like we the, want to the make sure the, that the information that we're posting out is of interest to them. We want to be able to respond if they're tagging us, you know, if they're tweeting at us, et cetera. And I think the real reason it's important is because you're building a relationship with your audience. So if you are not listening to what they have to say or responding to what they have to say, then mm -hmm. that relationship the doesn't develop and they will very quickly not follow your social when platforms. You look at when the, most people think of social media, they yeah, assume the it's one, all about yeah, getting their message out to other people. But there's another side to social then media that is two, equally, if not even more important, skills. listening and monitoring yeah, were, what people are saying about your brand. Social, social, social listening and monitoring can give you the opportunity to manage your reputation, determine new avenues of product development, and to get ahead of your competitors. Plus, customers want to feel heard on social media. According to research done by Sprout Social, 83% of respondents like when brands respond to questions, and 68% like when brands join conversations. Being responsive on social media clearly makes a difference. After all, 48% of customers make a purchase with a brand who is responsive to its customers and prospects on social media. So what's the difference between social listening and social monitoring? Social monitoring is actively looking for mentions and conversations that pertain to your brand, your products, your hashtags, your employees, your competitors, and your customers. Social listening is how you track analyze and the, respond to conversations the across the internet. In, in short, the social media monitoring and listening is crucial and to the health and success the, of any social media marketing uh, campaign you plan to run, or, as well as the ultimate success of your business. Medicine. I think that social well, listening can impact the, the way that brands uh, interact with their fans For example, in, the in the sense that it all really comes down yeah, to differentiating from what your competitors are doing. Are they like unresponsive on social media? Are they unhelpful? Are people yeah, like having negative responses to them? The That's your opportunity to come in and be the funny persona, be the helpful persona, uh, or establish your brand in a way that sets you apart from the public. The general meeting itself could have the how to interpret ECG and the, and such kind of things. Surgery had something like how to do an IND, 
you know, ear, nose, and throat, same with the idea how to examine the things you do at primary health care level. That is what we, we looked at. Uh, uh, so these, these were the, the list, the, the skills which are on the list. And you find that the eye, ear, and nose, they were a combined, uh, combined skill. They were so, uh, they were really agreed to this skill, which suggests the, uh, that uh, they were probably not doing it well, or they were having problems with the referrals. Hence, they want to, that this skill could be seen as relevant in their current practice and going forward. The skills which were less agreeable, postpartum care, antenatal care, forensic. When you look at the postpartum care, it's also related to antenatal care and also, also to maternity self. Uh, is, uh, GPs are not very comfortable doing this. Oh, uh, I think the reason being that they could be, uh, they, they, they could risk medical legal, medical legal uh, uh, problems. So because of that, they, they really didn't like uh, this kind of skills to be done in their practices. The least agreeable to, was the, the abdominal skill. Uh, in under abdominal skill, there was the rectal examination, proctoscopy. They didn't like this because I think they thought it would do. It needs special preparations and uh, environments. Competences in terms of competences, we normally look at the the competences we look at uh, are mainly the six. What there are six, you know, in the pre in the study which was done, they did twelve, but these were combined to make it six, and these six are the ones we look at in terms of uh, outcomes for the diploma course, as well as post postgraduate family medicine training, to be a competent clinician. So to be, uh, this is more of a scope, as I said, these are the list of competences. To be a competent clinician means you need, you need to have broad and uh, multidisciplinary kind of skills. And this only comes if you work in a district hospital for many years. Then you'll be able to give anesthesia, you'll be able to give the, to do cesarean sections, you'll be able to do uh, INDs, the shoulder dislocation, you'll be able to reduce dislocation, you'll be able to do uh, simple obstetric uh, procedures and all that. So you need to be a competent clinician and also a change agent. You know, this conference is talking about change, change is the only constant in this life. We change all the time. So as clinicians and general practitioners, we need to be change agents. Change agents in terms of implementation of national policy, as well as the uh, participating and working with the community and changing them for the better in terms of healthcare, empower, empowering them and all that. You need to be a critical thinker, analyzing lab results, analyzing trends, analyzing the epidemiology, the stats. You need to be a capacity builder in that you should be uh, teaching, you should be empowering others. You need to to ensure that there's uh, some form of continuous professional development in your practice. You have to keep updated. You need to be a collaborator. You know, uh, somebody who who works with others and it works. I uh, you know as a principal of family medicine. And you need to be an advocate for the community, community involvement and participation. So these are the things we looked at, and there are the elements under there in the full in the full tool. It showed who a competent clinician is. So when we looked at this, we found that all the listed competences except one were agreeable to GP's practice. In the responses were more than eighty percent across, you know, and the, the only one which they didn't feel they were doing enough was the community advocacy. You know, where we then need that when we do plan our training, we need to really emphasize that there is an element of community participation. Um, then the, in terms of associations between the skills and the type of, pri of private practice, because these were the ones which were significant, uh, statistically significant, with odds ratios there, the word chart square, p-value, and confidence intervals. We found that work experience was the most significant predictor of association uh, in relation to using orthopedic skills. So if you had a more work experience, you were probably very good at the uh, orthopedic skills. 
So when you plan training, the more experienced people, you sort of will not dwell too much on orthopedic. If you're dealing with the younger ones, you could then spend a lot of time on orthopedic. General practitioners of 40 years and above, 40 years and above of experience. I nearly six. The four, rise like of social media is green. arguably one of the most important advances but in modern history. It has the power to influence music and art, green. to change and shape you know, governments, um, and it's very important to businesses the, to connect sellers with uh, buyers all over so the world. Wear, Why yeah, is that? Likely, because of the power of one to one relationships and the incredible the reach now available from the one to the many. Through digital and social media, you have the ability to direct. So reach your customers and prospects in unprecedented uh, ways, with greater reach and more specific targeting than ever before. Are, and yet, those same customers and prospects wield a great like deal of power themselves. Image. Uh, they choose when and where they want to respond to your marketing messages. They also have the ability to be vocal with their opinions about your brand and your products. That's why social listening is crucial to your digital strategy. Social listening is how you track, analyze, and respond to conversations across the internet. By monitoring social media discussions about your industry, your company, and your products and customers, you can shape the direction of the conversation. It will help you get a leg up on your competition and inform both brand and business decisions. Done right. It will even help you save both time and money. Social listening is the perfect opportunity to figure out what your audience really thinks about you, your industry, and your competitors. 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had agencies that were around just to do market research, and they would put all the people in a room, and they would ask them all these questions. You don't have to do that now. You have Twitter. You have Facebook. You have Instagram. You have all of these opportunities to figure out exactly what people are saying about your brand unfiltered. You know what they love about you, what they hate about you, what they wish you could improve, what they wish you could change, and you can see them actually talking to potential other customers for you. They could be getting you new business, or they could be losing new business for you. You can do social listening with free tools such as the ones that you see here. There are also a variety of paid social listening tools available, such as HubSpot social media tools which are available as part of HubSpot's paid offering. There are eight key benefits to doing social listening. The first benefit is that it gives you the opportunity to measure the performance of your social media, web, and even to some extent your conversations and offline content strategy. You can measure the results from marketing and sales campaigns, including mentions, comments, shares, reshares, and the volume and sentiment of the conversation around your content. Did people love your last blog post or did it ruffle feathers? Do videos resonate better than static images? Did your customers share content to their social channels from the last email you sent to your mailing list? Once you discover what types of content work best, you might consider how to use similar content in targeted ads. Social metrics should be a crucial part of evaluating your content strategy as a whole. Second, social listening helps you manage reputation. If that blog post did ruffle feathers and you suddenly have a tweet storm on your hands, understanding the full extent of the conversation is key. If you're aware of the conversation early on, you can respond in a timely manner and potentially turn the tide of the conversation. If your customers are complaining about your company or product, you can respond publicly about how you'll make it right. Third. Social listening helps you identify your biggest fans and influencers. This is important because people trust word of mouth more than they trust brand conversations. In fact, according to Market Force, 81% of U.S. online consumers' purchase decisions are influenced by their friends' social media posts versus 78% who are influenced by the posts of the brands they follow on social media. Once you've identified your super fans, think and reward them for their loyalty and support. Engage with and involve them in conversations, content, and your campaigns. Leverage their word of mouth to increase the reach of your messages. Fourth, social listening can help you discover new product ideas or ways to enhance features on existing products. Listen to what your customers and prospects are talking about to discover their pain points and make shifts to address them with better product features or services. You can identify some of the biggest detractors and invite them to meet with your product team to share their ideas. You can also look for gaps and weaknesses in your competition's products and up the ante with your own development schedule. One great example of a company who used social listening to develop a product and create a smart marketing campaign at the same time is Netflix. When they discovered through social listening that many of their customers that were binge-watching shows were falling asleep, they realized they had an amazing opportunity. What did they do? They invented Netflix socks, smart socks that detect when you dozed off 
and send a signal to your TV, automatically pausing your show. Never again will you binge watch yourself to sleep, only to wake up two seasons later wondering what happened, or fall into the middle of a spoiler. Of course, these socks went viral, winning a Shorty Award, and best of all, endearing millions of people to their brand. I just mentioned the fifth benefit of social listening, watching the competition. Social listening helps you learn from monitoring your competitors, ranging from how their content performs with their audience to how happy their customers are, and what the world at large is saying about them. Six, social listening can lead to new business opportunities. Monitoring can help you identify gaps in your current industry offerings. Are your customers and prospects asking for something that isn't yet provided? Is there an underutilized sector of your industry that your company might be able to service? You can also identify trends early on and shift direction to take advantage of those opportunities. The seventh way that social listening can make a difference for your business is by helping you find leads. For example, some companies look for unhappy customers of a competitor and reach out with an offer to help. If the company is responsive when other companies are not, then switching may often be an easy decision for the customer. The eighth and final way you can use social listening is to help you set strategic benchmarks for your future, including listening metrics in your strategy. Metrics like the volume of engagement, sentiment, shares of your content, mentions, and more will give you the baseline you need to set better social media and business goals for the quarters and years ahead. There are two modes of listening to think about, monitoring and engagement. Monitoring is the method of actively looking for mentions and conversations that pertain to your brand, your products, your hashtags, your employees, your competitors, and your customers. Engagement is the step you have to take to have conversations with individuals talking about your industry, brand, products or services. If you're in the early stages of developing a digital promotion strategy, you may only need to be monitoring social media. But as your company grows, or in fact, to help directly drive that growth, you'll need to consider how you'll engage with your customers. In the ideal world, you'll monitor and engage your audience on all social channels. But when starting out, perhaps you might decide to only engage on Facebook or Twitter, depending on which network your buyer persona tends to frequent. Just make sure you're adequately directing your audience in all channels to the best way they can have a conversation with you, whether it's directing them to a specific social channel, a web page, or to an email address. You don't want to appear unavailable to an audience that's trying to reach you. There you have it. Social media listening is one of the best ways to get a jump on your competitors and to build loyalty with your customers. It really is one of the most important strategies any business can take to understand what the world thinks about its brand. Sometimes in excess of 30 patients a day, so you can just imagine the kind of care. So want to move away from that to where we can see our patients well or see them better. Thank you. Participants, please uh, poll for uh, Mr. John Muzendo on the topic presented on the clinical research stream. And uh, Mr. John, we received another question. Would more awareness about the issue among doctors start from medical school so that they are up and running what they start practicing? Uh, could you repeat the question then, please? Put more awareness about the issue among doctors start from medical schools so that they are up and running when they start practicing. I see, I see. Yes, you know, there is, thank you very much. The move has been, for that question, the move has been towards strengthening primary health care in the country, moving away from um, uh, specialist uh, or hospital-centric um, uh, uh, care to where we, we offer more promotive, more, more preventive kind of care. So the resources are being moved from tertiary institutions and quaternary healthcare programs to primary healthcare. And with it, the policies have also moved. In South Africa today, uh, medical interns spend two years. They spend the first one year in the uh, 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 clinical domains which are more general of uh, uh, domains, clinical medicine domains which are like pediatrics, you know, general surgery, internal medicine, and obstetrics and gynae. They spend the first year doing that. In the second year, they spend six months doing family medicine, which is a new thing in South Africa. Uh, family medicine, where well, they are doing that, and they are even interns, are even medical interns, they even come and do their rotation at primary health care centers within the community. 
so that uh, while they are while, while they are before they even start practicing uh, independently they should see the need for the community the need which the vision which is the vision of the of the country also when they are in medical school there is a, a program we call integrated primary health care program where all the uh, clinical medicine domains, the main domains, the four ones I said, they come together, they join with family medicine. And the family medicine is the one now which um, coordinates the integrated primary health care program for undergraduates. And uh, this program is started in a, a, as soon as possible. In a, after they've just had the theory is done, maybe in year three, they start, a, 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 we call it a, a integrated primary care, IPC, where they start visiting a, a facilities in the, across the country. They visit the district hospitals and the community health centers and the clinics. They are based there to spend some time learning about primary health care. So the whole mood is to strengthen primary health care through undergraduate and postgraduate training by looking at this list, which I said, which we've just discussed. And the, in so doing, we are actually uh, fine tuning the whole country to ensure that it delivers quality primary health care, because that is what the majority of the population are using. And that is what WHO advocates, that we need to ensure that we offer our health delivery services through primary health care. It does not stop us from doing a specialist and the super specialist the procedures and, the, and so on. But the majority of the patients, it's a pyramid kind of way. The primary health care is the most, is the, is the area where most patients are seen. And then going up to district hospital, then the next it should be the regional hospitals, then the tertiary hospitals. So then the resources should also follow where most of the population, the population are. So the country is geared towards doing that, right from training from primary health care, I mean, training from undergraduates. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. John. And uh, you can mention your email ID in the chat box so that uh, if any present, uh, presenters or participants uh, need any uh, queries related to that or concerns, they can contact you directly and you can reply to them. Thanks for your time. And now you can unshare your screen as well as you can disconnect the video and make yourself as a participant for this 8 TWCS. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. John. And uh, we are calling upon the next uh, speaker of the day, Dr. Purnur Siraj. Dr. Kordul Siraj is going to present on a keynote about the diet for management, improving public health and awareness of overdose, immunity booster for during pandemic. About a short note of Dr. Purnur Siraj, in 2006, Dr. Purnur Siraj received her MSc from Isabella Torbon College, Lucknow University, India, and her PhD was awarded in 2013 from King George Medical University. Presently, she is working as a deputy director at Disney Lucknow. She has more than nine years of teaching experience at UG and PG level. She worked with various national and international organizations like NICCD, NIN, WHO as a researcher and has more than three years of research experience. She has actively participated in various national and international seminars, webinars, workshops, and conferences. She has presented a lot of oral and poster and oral papers in various national and international conferences and was won Best Paper Award. She has filled one patent and a life member, lifetime member of IDA and HS. CAI. Today, she is going to present a topic about dietary management, improving public health and awareness of overdose, immunity booster, food during pandemic. Dr. Uh, Purna Suraj, welcome you ma'am for the HTWCS. Please, you can share your screen and you can proceed ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, your kind words. Uh, good morning everyone, I am Dr. Purna Suraj from uh, DS Institute of Naturopathy and Yoga. And today I'm here to present uh, 
Wait, can I share this? Yeah, I can uh, see the screen, ma'am. Thank you so much. You can uh, go for the slideshow button. Click on it. Okay, very good, ma'am. You can proceed now. The University of America for giving me opportunity to talk about such a uh, a uh, hot topic today and uh, it is as you can see on a screen my topic for the today's talk is dietary management improving improving uh, a public health and awareness of overdose immunity booster food during pandemic uh, as we all know in december 2019 there was an outbreak of pneumonia of unknown cause in wuhan china which affected more than 60 people on 20th of that month and on 31st of december the wuhan municipal health Com uh, committee informed the who that 27 people had been diagnosed with pneumonia of unknown cause being seven of them critically ill by january the first case of coronavirus disease has been reported outside the china two in thailand and one in japan then the rapid spread of the disease prompted the WHO to declare it as a health emergency of internal infrastructure. By that date, the disease has been detected in all province of ma uh, mainland of China. Cases were also diagnosed in 15 other countries. In March, the disease was already more than 100 deteriorates worldwide and recognized as pandemic by the WHO. At the present, the number of confirmed cases continue to grow. The COVID-19 patient can develop disease in different forms. They can be asymptomatic, have mild symptoms, or they can also have severe symptoms that can lead to hospitalization and in severe case death. The most serious clinical condition are characterized by acute respiratory distress syndrome, cardiac insufficiency, and septic shock. And these cause tissues damage in alveolar level, generating pathological tissue alterations, hyperpalacemia, and infiltration. So, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately to date, no specific treatment has been found for the cure of these, uh, this virus. And therefore, it is advisable to implement all possible strategies in order to prevent infection. Uh, due to novelty of this pandemic, scientific community is currently looking for effective vaccine as well as drug to treat the pathology. One of the biggest challenge is focus on the reducing inflammation without compromising the correct immune response of the patient. In this scenario, Science should focus not only on uh, its effective drugs, but also in nutrition. Nutritional influence on the immune system has been well documented in literature. In general, we are practicable. An effective way to reduce the risk of viral infection is to regulate the action of inflammation mediated through adaptable risk factors such as diet, exercise, and healthy lifestyle. Social media is a powerful tool for businesses, but it can feel overwhelming when you're just getting started. Unlike other communication channels, social media offers so many options and tools that some companies have successfully adopted a social-only marketing strategy. Here at HubSpot Academy, we tend to recommend a more balanced approach by combining social media, search engine optimization, email marketing, and content marketing in a holistic inbound strategy. It all comes down to knowing your buyer persona and aligning your strategy with their behaviors. One real-time way to stay on top of your buyer persona and their consumer behavior is through social monitoring. There is a difference between social listening and social monitoring. These two activities may seem similar at first glance, and in many cases, they both involve the same tactics. Where they differ is in your objective. You can use social listening to centralize conversations about your brand so that you can join them.
Social listening may be used by sales reps, social media managers, and even executives in your company. On the other hand, you can use social monitoring to actively look for mentions and conversations that pertain to your brand, your products, your hashtags, your employees, your competitors, and your customers. Social monitoring aims to measure more broadly what the market is saying, not just about you, but about the problem your company solves and the topics your customers care about. For example, you might use Google Alerts to get email notifications when an article is published about a topic that your buyer persona cares about. You might use TweetDeck to monitor phrases, brands, and people that your buyer persona cares about on Twitter. Perhaps it's as simple as bookmarking a Facebook search in your browser and checking it regularly. Social monitoring is a really important part of monitoring your brand's reputation because your customers are on social media. You want to be listening to them there and fielding any questions that they may have, responding to complaints, um, and understand their perspective or point of view on the product or service that you're delivering to them. If you're responsive, timely, and helpful, that will then reflect positively on your business. No matter how you choose to do social monitoring, there are some clear benefits to being in the know about the things your buyer persona cares about. First of all, it puts you and your target buyer persona in the audience together. Here's what I mean. In a lot of ways, marketing is a two-way communication channel. You communicate with your customer about you, and they communicate with you about them. And the other party listens. Social monitoring allows you to listen to a third party. Other people and brands talking about the things you and your customers care about. It's no longer you and your audience talking about each other to each other. It's you and your audience talking to each other about a third subject or party. In doing so, you're saying, hey, we both care about this. Let's learn about it together. Talk about humanizing. Remember to be part of the conversation. You don't necessarily have to be the subject of it. There are some important dimensions to measure at this higher macro level. For instance, measure your brand reputation. In social monitoring, we're not responding to social media posts like we would in our social listening activities. Monitoring brand sentiment combines all of those individual messages into an overall reputation metric, along a spectrum of negative to positive. For example, HubSpot Academy Academy has an extremely positive sentiment on social media. The sentiment we share back, we love our fans. So when something goes wrong in the product or with a marketing campaign, which can happen, and we see that sentiment drop, we know that we have some work to do to get that sentiment back up. Be on the lookout for brand damaging conversations and customer unrest. Social customer service is the new normal for organizations. 56% of consumers will unfollow a brand if they deliver poor customer service on social media. And 40% of customers expect a response within one hour after posting a complaint in social media. If people have questions about your product or service, Make sure your support team is ready to respond in a helpful way. You might even keep a customer from churning if you work in a subscription-based business. These conversations in social media can also inform your product or service. Are people unhappy with a particular feature? Or maybe a recent change to your service offering? Are they excited about a particular feature they're trying for the first time? Use this market intelligence to guide other teams in your organization. Use social media monitoring to track links to your website on social media, engagement from campaigns, and check on the sentiment and performance of your marketing campaigns. By doing this, you'll learn whether your campaign content is resonating with your audience. To make this easier to track, consider using a hashtag for your marketing campaign. This way, you'll have an easy way to track the conversations and your audience will know where to find the conversation as well. Tracking links created by appending UTM parameters to any links back to your website can help you monitor exactly where traffic came from. In this example, we append a source, medium, and campaign, so we know exactly where traffic to academy.hubspot.com came from in our website analytics. Let's talk about how social monitoring can boost your recruiting efforts. The most important asset in your organization isn't the website, and it's not the building your office is in, or even the product or service you sell. It's the people who bring all those things together into a growing business. Recruiting, therefore, may be the single most important activity your organization performs on a regular basis. And monitoring social media can help you recruit more diverse, talented, and remarkable employees for your team. Your HR recruiting team can also use social monitoring to apply an inbound marketing approach to their recruiting efforts. Just like the buyer persona you've identified to be a potential best fit customer for your product or service, Create a job seeker persona that is a potential best fit employee for a particular job opening. And in the same way a marketer would listen to and monitor the opinions of a buyer persona, 
Do the same with your job seeker persona. If potential candidates are active on social media, they're giving you a way to understand them better, learn what they value in an organization, and fine tune your job descriptions, interviews, and career page to suit their priorities. Remember, social media monitoring helps to inspire and inform your content, your brand, and can even extend to your product or recruiting strategies. Gene 6 have been reported with the consumption of these kind of carbohydrates due to the inflammatory status that usually occur, occurs in respiratory infections such as COVID-19, limiting the consumption of food rich in these carbohydrates may be advisable. Adequate amount of fiber is the next thing with the regard to fiber, which is important for correct metabolic functioning has been widely reported. Several studies have revealed that an adequate fiber intake that is around 25 to 35 gram per day may help to reducing both systemic and gut inflammation. Indeed, the consumption of food that are source of fiber has been related to lower level of inflammatory cytokines as well as enhance the level of short chain fatty acids. So, it has direct inflammatory effect by inhibiting the release of pro inflammatory molecules and by decreasing the expression of nuclear factor moreover short chain fatty acids also play an important role in maintenance of the adequate gut microbiota by increasing the diversity as well as enhancing the presence of specific health associated bacteria besides gut microbiota uh, esopharyngeal microbiota may also be involved in respiratory infection and the, uh, it has been reported that this kind of infections may result in uh, altered gut microbiota and innate immune system response. Taking into account that COVID-19 has been related to respiratory and gastrointestinal system, it seems possible that gut microbiota impairment may occur. Which, is, uh, which in turn can result in an enhanced inflammatory status. You can see in this slide. Here are the effect of several nutrient on immune system function and other important aspects on COVID-19 infections such as oxidative stress, inflammation and thrombiosis. As you can see in the figure, the protein of high biological value, omega-3 fatty acid, vitamin A, vitamin C, dietary fiber and selenium copper have anti-inflammatory effect on coronavirus because uh, various vitamin A, C and D have protection against respiratory infection. Omega-3 fatty acid, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin E have antioxidant effect, and polar lipids have anti-thrombiotic effects, whereas vitamin E, iron, and zinc increase the immune function. So the disease severity decreases and enhance, enhance the recovery or clinical outcome and decrease the hospital stay. Uh, here we can see different nutrient and <coughs> uh, the, the key role in disease with immune function and their recommended dietary allowances for healthy individual and disease infected patients. Let me, uh, let's see, vitamin E, I just want to give a little brief about it. Uh, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and folate, iron, magnesium, and trace elements including zinc, selenium, and copper play a pivotal role in disease subsequently and the maintenance of immune function deficiencies and their inadequate status in these nutrients may negatively affect the immune system, resulting in decreased resistance against infection. The patient's vitamin and mineral are essential for adaptive immunity as they are involved in cytokine production, lymphocyte differentiation and qualification, antibody production. Body production and generation of memory cells. Regarding to innate immunity, they also, they also contribute to the maintenance and development of physical barrier and differentiation of innate cells. 
production and activity of antimicrobial proteins, phagocytic activities of neurophils and macrophages, and regulation of the overall inflammatory responses. The relationship between vitamin A and the infection has been extensively described. In the case of respiratory infection, vitamin A play a pivotal role in the, its involvement in healthy mucus layer formation as well as enhancing antigen non-specific immune response. In these histopathological alterations have been described in pulmonary epithelial ileum and parenchyma in subjects with vitamin A deficiency, resulting in impaired respiratory function. Consequently, adequate intake of these vitamins should be guaranteed in order to avoid the further complication uh, in case of COVID-19. So here uh, we start with vitamin C. Uh, the immune function in uh, uh, maintenance of functional and structure, uh, structural integrity of mucosal cell in the innate barriers, normal functioning of B cells, antimicrobial, anti inflammatory, and antioxidant effects, antibody production, reduction, uh, reduction of respiratory tract, and lung infection risk. The, a healthy individual can take up to 200 mg per day, whereas the diseased person can take 1 to 2 mg per day of vitamin C. Whereas uh, vitamin D, as far as vitamin D is concerned, the association of vit uh, vitamin D deficiency and respiratory tract infection, the lung injury has been widely reported. Indeed, the usage of vitamin D has shown effectiveness on these conditions. Furthermore, previous investigation also demonstrate that the high doses of supplementation of vitamin D, that is too bad. 50,000 international unit to five like international unit per day is safe and effective in improving the healthy status of mechanically ventilator in critically ill patients, which results in shorter the hospital stay. So here are the immune function of vitamin D is maintenance of functional and structural integrity of mucosal cell in innate barriers, normal functioning of T cell, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant effect, antibody production and antigen response, direction of Hello, Dr. Purnar, we are facing some uh, noise from your background. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Is this fine? Yeah, fine. Experience of functional and structural integrity of mucosal cells with meat barrier, normal functioning of T cells, antimicrobial, anti inflammatory, and antioxidant effects, antibody production, and antigen responses, uh, reduction of respiratory tract and lungs infection risks, alleviation of inflammatory response, and the uh, recommended dietary allowances for vitamin D. 2000 international unit and which is increased uh, during the disease or infected per person that is 10,000 international unit with few weeks followed by the 5,000 international unit. Purnar, Dr. Purnar, uh, you are facing the same uh, noise from your end. Noise. Yeah, some noise is, yeah, it, now it's fine. Is vitamin, e. vitamin E has been related to the correct function of hormonal and innate immune function. Indeed, the ability of vitamin E to scavenge rich in oxygen species plays an important role in oxidative stress reduction. 
exerting anti-inflammatory effects in addition vitamin E also protects pollen saturated uh, pupa and immune cells from oxidation. Uh, immune function of uh, vitamin E are in dominance of, uh, of functional and structural integrity of mucosal cell in innate carriers, differentiation and, and functioning of innate immune cells, inflammatory and antioxidant effects, antibody production and antigen response. Protection of respiratory tract and lung infection risk, support of T cell mediate immunity. Uh, requirement for vitamin D, uh, vitamin E is 50 mg per day as per the RDA, but it should be increased to up to 200 international units per day. Uh, like uh, uh, omega 3 fatty acid, vitamin D, and DHA. The immune function of these are conversion of specialized co resolving mediators such as protecting and resolving the medicines to relieve the inflammation and enhance lung injury. The recommended allowances are 250 to 300 mg per day, whereas a deceased person can take up to 1500 to 300 mg per day. Selenium. Selenium also play an essential role in the immune system due to its anti-inflammatory effect. This effect is in line with significant benefits of selenium supplementation demonstrate against other viral infections including HIV, hepatitis B, link liver cancer or epidemic hemorrhagic fever. Uh, uh, here the immune function of selenium are uh, differentiation and functioning of innate immune cells, normal functioning of T cells, antibody production, antimicrobial and anti inflammatory and antioxidant effect. The RDA for the healthy person it should be 50 mg per day, and for deceased person it should be increased to 200 mg per day. This is same. Regard to the zinc. Dr. Purna, uh, can you please uh, raise your voice? I think the attendees can't able to hear your voice uh, low. Just wait one minute. No, your eyes is still uh, very low, Dr. Purnar. Am I audible now? Yeah. So, with regard to zinc, uh, zinc iron concentration inhibits the replication of coronavirus. On the other hand, zinc deficiency is linked with protective cell mediated immune response as well as with increased susceptibility for various infections. Indeed, it has been suggested that increased zinc intake may exert beneficial effects on COVID-19 infections by reducing gastrointestinal and lower the respiratory symptoms. In addition, it has been suggested that zinc intake of 30 to 50 mg per day may be exert beneficial effect on RNA of viruses. So the maintain the immune function of zinc are maintenance of functional and structural integrity of mucosal cells, innate barriers, differentiation and functional of innate immune cell, anti macrobial anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effect, antibody production, antigen response support of thromboside and cytokine functions, and innate and immunity over within 24 hours and that need, uh, that should be divided into six to eight doses each separate by two three hours when away zinc glutamate at 13.3 gram per day within three days at least. Iron 
iron is a nutrient with diverse implication covid-19 on the one hand it is well known the importance of iron for the correct functioning of immune system however it is also well established that iron containing enzymes are essential for completing the vi- completing of virus replication process particularly corona virus the immune function of iron are uh, maintenance of functional and structural integrity of mucosal cell in innate barriers differentiation and functioning of innate immune cell normal functioning of t cells microbial inflammatory oxygen a healthy man can take up to 8 mg per day women age in 19 to 50 18 mg per day and women more than the 51 can take 8 mg per day whereas the disease person can take various iron salt 16 mg iron per day and it should be taken with food to avoid gastric discomfort as far as multivitamin supplementation along with multi minerals because we all know multivitamin and multi minerals have protective and regulatory function they are the same immune function the support of cells and tissues of immune system overall maintains the development of in innate barriers growth and dif- Uh, differentiation of innate cells and body production and generation of memory cell production and activity of antimicrobial proteins phagocytic activities of neurophils and macrophages supplying of nutrient requirement according to 100% rda for age and gender that this is an additional to a well balanced diet recommendations for nutritional treatment so in general recommendation for covid-19 patients is to follow healthy diet to maintain a correct immune function optimal intake of all nutrients and with those that play crucial role in immune system should be assured to a diverse and well balanced diet so that there is a prevalent micronutrient and omega 3 fatty acid deficiency in several population groups found in various studies in order to promote the optimal functioning of the immune system and to reduce the risk and consequences of infections the intake for some micro nutrients may exceed the recommended dietary allowances since infections and other stressors can reduce micronutrient status the supplement may help restoring their normal blood level regard to supplementation it is important to advise the general public to always consult a medical doctor prior to consuming such products such, uh, as they can interact with other nutrient drugs and medical treatment indeed they can turn into toxic elements causing several disorders and aggravating certain conditions the nutritional therapy in non clinically ill hospitalized covid-19 patient as far as the macronutrient concern nutritional management strategies adopt for uh, less ill patient uh, because it is low palatability of the hospital meals make the energy and protein intake low which can lead to the bad nutritional status of patient in this scenario the oral treatable patients of covid-19 receive a personalized meal provision which is completed with oral nutritional supplement in order to meet the energy uh, meet the energy and protein requirement in the case of patient who are unable to eat integral and parenteral nutrition formulas rich in protein Poor in glucose are provided. Based on the knowledge acquired by the different studies, while working with patients who were recovering uh, recovering from COVID nineteen, a three step nutritional protocol has been designed. The first step of this protocol would be focus on the nutritional assessment. and malnutrition screening of the patient for this purpose different 
anthropometric parameters as well as the body composition of the patient are studies. Further, the weight loss is monitored and the different uh, blood tests, including the blood count, protein, sorry, capacity of the patient should also be considered. Uh, finally, uh, finally, after evaluating uh, the nutritional status of the patients, Second step devoted the setting the nutritional treatment of the patient patients. In this regard, the management management of computerized system of the hospital. In this scenario, energy requirement are calculated using the predictive equations, which are adapted to the nutritional status of the patients according to their clinical status, physical activity, and stress condition. So here, as far as the natural nutrients are concerned, energy should be given according to the stress level of the patient, and the protein should be given from more than one uh, gram per kg body weight. It should be increased from one to one point three gram per kg body weight, but it should uh, be advisable to give one point five gram of protein per kg body weight per. So, uh, the carbohydrate and fat, uh, here is a mistake that fat and carbohydrate ratio, that uh, fat should be 30% and carbohydrate should be 70% with the uh, patient with respiratory insufficiency and 50-50% with respiratory insufficiency. And the micronutrient important, uh, including the vitamins, minerals and trace elements in water, it should be given according to the RDA. And the next is nutritional therapy in critical ill hospitalized COVID-19 patient. Some COVID-19 patients experience several respiratory symptoms and multi-organ failure. Being very ill at hospital admission and thus needing specialized support. Indeed, acute respiratory complications requiring prolonged ICU stays are a major cause of morbidity and mortality in COVID 19 patients. Most of these patients rapidly progress from the cup and then to respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilations. Consequently, the timing of nutritional intervention appears to be critical. Therefore, the nutritionists should be choose the most appropriate way to recover the subject's health. As with other critically ill patients, nutritional management is an integral component of good supportive care. The European Society of Clinical Nutrition SISPEN has recently published some guidelines for nutritional management of patients of COVID-19 infection. In this guideline, specific recommendations are included for patients hospitalized, hospitalized in ICUs. Among them, early enteral nutrition when possible use to use of agents and promote gastric emptiness in initiating of peripheral nutrition in situations in which enteral nutrition is not possible or tolerated and use of internal nutrition after expedition when oral feeding is not tolerated. According to these SPEN guidelines, internal nutrition is preferred for patients in ICO to receive mechanical ventilation. However, the specific need of patients with COVID-19 may require, uh, require the adoption of prone ventilation or neuromuscular blocking. And the consequently, internal nutrition implementation in daily practice would be difficult. On the other hand, the, ch the chances include, in, included by the disease itself in the gastrointestinal tract of the patients along with the elevated sedation required for these patients make difficult to provide adequate nutritional support. On such consideration is related to gastrointestinal hypomotility that is commonly found in these patients within the high doses of sedation of the Opioids that are the needing to facilitate mechanical ventilation since the other patient under similar condition do not present feeding tolerance. Moreover, despite several but similar, uh, similar to the less uh, 
typically in patient energy requirement uh, must be 20 to 30 kilocalorie calories per day per kg body weight for very morbid patient and patient with age more than 65 years of course very severely underweight polymorbid patients respectively. Protein requirement should also be 1 gram per kg body weight in older people and for those who are um, less than 65 years of age it should be around 1.3 to 1.5 gram per kg body weight per day. Carbohydrate and fat, the fat should be 30 percent of total non-protein protein calories and carbohydrate should be 70 percent of calories with the sources of uh, complex carbohydrates with no respiratory deficiencies and in 50-50% uh, with ventilated patients. Carbohydrates should be uh, 2 gram per kg body weight per day not exceeding from 150 gram per day. And the micronutrients all pertaining to the and place and meal and water should be given according to the heart. Adverse effect of overdose of immunity booster food. Don't overdose on supplements. They can impact on your organs first. Immunity supplements are taken with the notion that they help. Excuse me, uh, Dr. Uh, Purna. Uh, yes. The time is getting uh, uh, going to close for your session. We have uh, some more students on the line. Can you please uh, finish it fast? Can I uh, take only two minutes to complete this? Yeah, yeah, please, please. So don't over the post the supplement that uh, they can impact on organs when it helps to reduce post unexpected risk and their ingredient have some strong effect on the body. Some have liver damage, some uh, herbs have uh, effect on the acute liver injury. Prolonged consumption of Karha in ward, uh, wards of COVID-19 did lead to several uh, severe acid, acidity, acid reflux, heartburn and bleeding from the stomach due to the gastric ulcer, eyes, nausea and vomiting. Consumption of hot water did bring patient to OPD with burns in the mouth and food pipe. Too much use of steam did damage the nasal mucosa and made people prone to sinus infections. Too much consumption of turmeric turmeric lead to diarrhea, headaches and yellow stool. Too much Tulsi consumption also lead to liver injury since it interacts with blood thinner. This is why it is not advisable to, for the pregnant woman. Excessive intake of vitamin pills over a long period should also be avoided, especially with those containing high doses of fat soluble vitamin A, B, K that can lead to neurological problems, high calcium levels and muscular weakness and liver damage and irregular heart Beats and appetite lose uh, and nerves damage. Selenium overdose also uh, can cause brittle nails, hairs, nerves damage, and gastric upset. Since supplement take a long time, can cause proper iron deficiency and causing anemia and decreasing anemia. In fact, they can lead to more prone to the infection. Excessive intake of vitamin C can trigger acidity, cause nausea and diarrhea, and interfere with the antioxidant pro oxidant balance of the body. To avoid complications of excessive, uh, excessive immunity booster, please take talk to your doctor before using them. Also, read about the contents of your supplements. Avoid unnecessarily prolonged usage and follow a healthy lifestyle that is both imperative and built immunity. Take away messages consuming nutritious food, eating more whole plants, food, healthy fats. Fermented foods rich in probiotic, limiting sugar intake, drinking adequate water, and managing your stress level along with regular exercise and getting enough sleep are the most important ways to boost your immunity system. Getting vaccination on time is the need of our own schedule vaccination schedule for your children and elderly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kornur uh, Siraj. Uh, for the presentation under the topic of dietary management, improving uh, public health and awareness of overdose immunity booster for during pandemic. Uh, can you share your email ID in the chat box so that if anybody having any queries or some concerns or any clarification, they can contact you and you can reply to them. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. You can unshare your screen and uh, thanks for your valuable time and also have a nice day.
Our next uh, speaker, I request um, Mr. Roderick to turn on the video as well as uh, Mr. Roderick is going to present on the topic, the benefits of technological development on business, a survey conducted among uh, SMEs in the city of Beni, Decro uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. I welcome uh, Mr. Roderick. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Good thank morning. Thank you so much uh, for your afternoon. Thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roderick. Kindly share your screen, please. Okay. Can you share your screen, please? Okay, this yeah. is yes, yes, I can. can you see Please check the internet connectivity from your okay. end. Thank you very much. Please check your internet connectivity at okay. your end as, as well as click on the slideshow button. So it will be enlarged. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Please proceed. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is um, Rodrigo Calumendo. I'm uh, a PhD candidate in management. Uh, we focus on information systems. And I'm a lecturer at the Adventist University of Lukanga in DRC. And this uh, today, I'm very pleased to be here with you. And uh, my topic is uh, the benefit of the technology logical development on business, a survey conducted among CMA in Beni Democratic Republic of Congo. And before I start, I will tell you that I'm a French speaking student from Texas American University. So I beg you to understand whether I will speak in English, which may be very coherent. And uh, this theme is uh, a part of my thesis my dissertation, which is uh, entitled Information System Effectiveness and uh, Impact on Business Performance in Developing Countries. And uh, as summary, as Congolese small and medium com company are increasingly interested in the use of technology, very few studies to our knowledge have been conducted in our DRC and our country to assess the success of ICD. Companies are investing, but uh, no studies to assess the success of ICD. This, this is why we wanted to conduct this uh, research. And we interviewed uh, 119 MA selected by the Covenant Sampling Method. And we used the Pearson correlation to study the relationship between business sector and the benefit and the relationship between the amount invest in ICT and the benefit which can be derived from ICT investment. The results show that there is a positive relation between the amount invest in ICT and the benefit of ICT. And in terms of benefit in general, CMA in Beni in the identified an increased profit, optimized time management, reduced proper work, improved quality, and improved financial reporting quality. And so what was the problem actually? Uh, the problem comes from the fact that CMA are now playing a significant role in economy. Uh, this is because these small and medium companies can uh, easily adapt to change. They require low capital in investment and even in management, they require low cost and they are becoming very important, mainly in developing countries. And to play properly their role, CMA use now technologies. Every year they invest amount, a great amount of money in technology. And this stunt of investing amount of money in technology has motivated researchers around the world, mainly in a developed country, who are trying to understand the benefit of technology on business. But most of 
studies have been carried out in uh, developed countries and finding of these studies can't be generalized easily in developing countries. Because Stonk said that uh, the environment in which a business operates has an impact on uh, technologies. And while in DRC, more and more small and medium companies are turning to computerized information systems, no studies have been carried out to assess the benefits of uh, this development or this investment in technologies. This is why we wanted to understand whether these uh, investments are benefit to our companies or not. This is the reason of these studies. So we interviewed 199 CMLs, which were selected by Kavner Sampling Method, as I said previously, and to identify the barriers and the advantage of, of ICT. So in terms of barriers, we use the average and uh, the item which had uh, the average of uh, 0.5 was selected as a benefit or a barrier. And for the relationship between the amount invested in technology and uh, the relationship between technology and sectoral activities, we use the Pearson correlation test. And regarding to the result, the, this research aimed to identify the benefit of uh, using ECT among business in the town of Beni. And the other objective was to identify the barriers in investments in technology. So we wanted also to understand the relationship which exists between the amount, the money invested in technology and the benefit of technologies. We wanted also to understand if there were a relationship between the industry in which the company is operating and the benefit of ICDs. And as a result, a uh, 60, 61% of semi interviewed are investing less than uh, $5,000 in ICD. This was uh, the two past years. They invested less than uh, $5,000. This is an issue really in our country because for the moment, companies are not investing a larger amount of money in uh, ECDs. This is maybe because uh, they, don't un they don't really understand the benefit of ICDs. And it's from uh, two years by now, where the government insisted of the fact, on the fact of investing and in ICDs. So companies are starting, but as you can see the amount, they, they are really starting. It's, uh, it's not a considerable amount of money. And the benefits which were identified in term uh, are include, include improved performance, Increased profit, optimized time management, reduced proper work, improved quality information quality, enhanced financial quality. Uh, our companies in uh, Beni, where we carried out the studies, are uh, investing in uh, in TPS. They, they are still basics. This is the reason. Mr. Rodrigue? Hello, Mr. Rodrigue? And in terms of relationship uh, between the investment in uh, ICTs and benefits of uh, ICTs,
these issues with uh, the network, but I was uh, identifying the benefits of uh, ICTs. Uh, I was identifying the benefits of ICTs, and we will say that in terms of uh, benefits, the relationship between uh, the amount invested in ICTs and uh, the benefits of uh, derived from these ICTs, it's clearly that uh, plus you invest in uh, ICTs, the more advantage will derive from uh, ICTs. And in terms of uh, the relationship between the business industry and uh, in terms of the relationship between the business industry and the, and the benefit, we found that there was no positive relationship between uh, this advantage and uh, the, the, the sector and the advantage. And this, uh, the results of these studies are supported by DIPA and Embereki, who reported that ICTs has significant benefit on an organization. And the results are also related to Wells finding which indicate that the consistent investment in technology was associated with better performance. This means plus our company invests in ICTs, the more advantage it will derive from this investment. And the barriers that uh, was cited by Sam as in Beni had already been identified by Masudi with the French companies. So about uh, the future research, we wanted uh, researchers, I'm sorry to have issue with uh, my PPT. I'm sorry. So in terms of uh, conclusion and future steps, we suggest the result of this show, show that there is a slow investment in technologies. So we suggest that uh, a research, a future studies, try to understand why business in Beni doesn't invest a considerable amount of money in uh, these uh, information technologies. And there is a positive correlation between investment and the advantage. And uh, future research may look to the benefit of technological on performance of uh, companies. And, and this is uh, this is the next step of our research. We are looking on the impacts. Also, it's uh, possible to extend the analysis to other part of the of of, uh, of the country because we carried out the study in uh, one city, but it's possible for future researchers to carry out the studies and to extend it to other parts of the country. And the research also may propose the researchers may also propose the model of adoption of technology in same A in developed country. As we have seen, countries, companies, small and uh, medium companies in uh, in developing country in developing countries, mainly in DRC, are not investing in uh, technologies. So we could suggest future research to try to see how can uh, this business adopt technologies. It's in terms of understanding the reason which are behind the lesser investment in technology and then propose a model of invest, investing in technology. As in other countries, in developed countries, it is an evidence that investing, investing in technologies may lead to better performance to, to business. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is the end of the presentation. Maybe if there are some questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Roger. Uh, we are enabling the 
poll session for Mr. Rogers' presentation. We are requesting attendees to uh, participate in poll. Also, we are requesting post your questions uh, on the presentation done by Mr. Roger. Attendees, we are requesting to post your questions in chat box or in QA session. So Roger, you got a good appreciation on your presentation. And we have one question. How about the skills of SME managers? Are they able to use technologies proposed effectively and efficiently? Yeah, this is a very good question because we wanted to understand, adapt it to the context of DRC, but results show that this was not a major issue. But some of our managers and the viewers said that they are not used to technologies. Anyway, the context of DRC is quite different for the context of other countries. This means that most of people are not familiar to technologies. This also may lead to not adopting technologies. Many businesses are afraid of adopting technologies because they are afraid of using them. So as now the government has started insisting on the fact of using technologies in business and universities and scholars nowadays are trying to teach students matters regarding to the use of technologies in business, even it's in a uh, half sector, uh, public sector, uh, commercial sector, they are trying now to start using those technologies. But actually, this is also another problem in our country where most of people are not used to these technologies. I would say that apart from uh, the two barriers identified, also the using of uh, the easy of adoption of technologies is uh, another another issue i've seen also another question technology needs electricity is there a constant electricity in drc actually this is another issue as you can see where um since i started my presentation i'm having issue with either a network or also electricity there is no really electricity as permanent in DRC. And uh, now some companies are managing with solar panels. They are trying to manage with um, these, uh, this electricity using solar panels and so on. But this is a really big issue. And in uh, the government, the government in its program is uh, promised to work on an uh, issue of electricity in these coming years, maybe by two or one year, there will be electricity. But in the, in the city where we carried out this study, there can be found some small solution for electricity. But actually, this is a big issue in uh, our country. Thank you, Mr. Roger. We have one more question. Uh, Using the technology to improve SMEs, how can the rural woman be able to use it without being educated? Uh, yes. Actually, the rural woman 
can't use technology without being educated. This is why every small and uh, medium company we interviewed, we are suggesting, I suppose this will be the suggestion of our dissertation, that companies should work with people who can manage technology. At least a business should have one or two person who could manage technology in it. Because we can't give to someone who is not educated technology to use it because they we they can they can be able to use it and they can't afford technology. This is uh, how companies should do it. They, they should find some people who can manage technology to to, to to be technology to be ICT specialists in their companies and. This is a good because the country and the, 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 the universities uh, program have included topics related to technologies. So we, we hope that uh, within uh, one, two or three years in the country, there will be many people who can be able to help business in uh, managing technology. Thank you, Mr. Roger. We have one more question. Is there any advocacy part of your study that will drive investment in technology by government? Yeah, uh, actually in our main study, we, we were suggesting the government to help companies in uh, affording technologies. This is uh, by providing electricity and also by working on uh, the cost of hardware because we are still importing all hardware from uh, other to work with those countries to help company to companies to afford the costs of uh, of software and hardware and uh, this is a suggestion we are giving to the government in our main uh, dissertation Great. Uh, we have a last question. Which single recommendation to stakeholders to match business with technology development? Uh, please, please, I don't, I don't understand pretty well. Which single recommendation to stakeholders to match business with technology development? You can see in chat okay, box. Uh, uh, Last Actually, question. the recommendation we are giving, yeah, I'm in the chat box. I've seen the question. Yeah, I've seen that first, could uh, adopting technology in may drive costs of product and service? Yes, it can. Because when adopting technologies, there are many proce procedures and there are reduction of costs and uh, of product and service. Because in terms of management, the cost of products and services depend also on the way you are managing, on the resource, on the input. So technology can help in reducing some input and then reduce the cost of products and services. Which in the recommendation to the second order to match business with uh, technological development. Actually, we are asking business in uh, DRC to to work toward uh, developing their uh, computerizing their information systems because around the world now this is now the trend and it's helping business because studies carried out in other countries show exactly that uh, technological development are helping the business. So we are asking uh, the business in our country to adopt technology because technology will help those business to develop and maybe those small and medium country when using technology and uh, when um, managing correctly can become bigger and uh, they can become multinational and big companies. So we are asking all the companies around the country to adopt technologies because these technologies can help them to improve their way of working. Well said, uh, Roger. And uh, we have a last question of your session. As per present contest of Congo, does the cost of implementation would not be considered a challenge? 
Yeah, I actually the cost is uh is, is a great challenge. The cost is a great challenge. But um the big the good thing is that uh in the countries there are now some students from uh the, the, the computer department or information technology who are trying to implement local solutions to, 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 to companies. As myself, I've developed many applications for business in uh, the country which are affordable. So actually the cost is a problem, but we are trying to find local solutions because we are the, 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 the big topic is innovation and we are trying to innovate in the country, proposing to companies solution that can be affordable and that the solution that can be also uh, adapt, adapted uh, easily to the context of uh, Congo. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roger, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, we are good to go with next presenter. We can move on to uh, as an attendee. Th th thank you very much. Next, we request you to call upon uh, Mr. Satya Reddy to present the topic on clinical profile of men with different sexual orientation. Yes, sir. You can give permission to share my. Yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Satya, can you please share yes. the screen? Yeah, we can be able to view. Yes, sir. So, the icon for you can have an option and below of the zoom. Yeah, we can able to view your screen. You can make it a slideshow and start your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Satya. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Satyanarayan Reddy, Arla. Because there is no introduction, I am Dr. Arla Satyanarayan Reddy. I am a professor and head of the Department of Obstetric Gynecology at Vinayaka Missions University, Karaikal Pondicherry, and also an adjunct professor in the Reproduction of Sexual Health at Indian Institute of Public Health, Hyderabad, and a consultant in Reproduction and Sexual Medicine at Apollo Fertility, Hyderabad, at the same time at TU Institute of Sexual Medicine, Hyderabad. And I am a research scholar of Texel American University. Completed PhD, awaiting the result of the PhD. My topic for a PhD is pornography induced erectile dysfunction in young men in South India. But today, but today I am going to present clinical profile of men with different sexual orientation. Because good number of the participants in this conference may not be may not be well versed with the concept of sexual orientation. I brief this August House about what is sexual orientation. Sexual orientation refers to romantic and sexual attraction to another person. A sexual attraction to a person of a same sex is that is men having sexual attraction towards men and women having sexual attraction towards women is homosexuality. In the same way, sexual attraction to the persons of the opposite sex, that is a man towards a woman and a woman towards a man is called heterosexuality. Having sexuality, sexual attraction towards both sexes is bisexuality. And Sexuality, sexual orientation is not a single entity. There is, it is a continuation from homosexuality at one extreme of the, our orientation to heterosexuality at the other extreme of the orientation. Now to tell you in a graphic way, here is a male who is, who is androphilic, that is attraction towards male then he is homosexual. A male who is gynephilic, that is having attraction towards female, is heterosexual. 
a female who is androphilic attraction towards males is called heterosexual a female who is gynephilic that is attraction towards female is homosexual then in addition to having sexual attraction he may do sex with a person that is having sex act with another man that is having sex with his with the man whom he is attracted to that is it is attraction followed by action he may be doing sex with a man that is a sexual behavior or sexual activity who learn that sexual orientation is a continuum from exclusive homosexuality to exclusive heterosexuality but there is a grade between this level of sexual attraction in say scale he is one such grading scale to assess the homosexual status of a man or sexual orientation status of a man it ranges between 0 to 6 0 being exclusively homosexual and 6 being exclusively homosexual there can be somebody who is intermediate also how prevalent is homosexuality that is how prevalent is homosexuality cannot be assessed correctly in a in the western society where homosexual people are accepted as their own or there is no homosexuality negative attitude in the society people came come out and then tell that they are homosexual but in conservative societies like india where homosexuality is now also he is viewed by the public as some aberrant sexuality people won't come out people won't reveal themselves so the obvious revelation of homosexuality will be different the actual homosexuality is different but in the western society 4% of the males are considered to be homosexual in india 1% of the men are said to be homosexual 0.5% of women in general population are said to be homosexual homosexuality by law is not uniformly uniform in the world in western countries are who are not who are very comfortable with homosexual attitudes of the persons you can see in the dark blue color all the western countries homosexuality is legal they can there is no discrimination and they can get married also and where it is not it is not protected that is there is no homo negativity but it is not a criminal offense it is not a crime to practice homosexuality these countries are depicted in pale blue color and in countries where homosexuality is criminalized having homosexual attraction or homosexual acts are crime it is depicted in the red color but india in the recent past have upgraded into a this color that is it is not criminalized in india now it is not in the red zone in india homosexual acts between consenting adults is not a crime at all now people can have a negative attitude towards homosexuality there are two varieties here the society having homo negative attitude towards the persons that is called homo negativity or homophobia phobia means that is aversion or not doing the society viewing this as aberrant or deviant per, deviant or sexual perversion there is another another homo negativity suppose a man who is homosexual by himself but have hatred towards his own homosexuality but have but have homosexual but have hatred towards other homosexual people he himself is a homosexual but he is having hatred towards homosexuality by whatever reason so he hates himself it is called internalized homosexuality now lgbtq that is lesbian gay 
bisexual, transsexual, queer person. When the society views these people with stigma, they feel stressed, develops psychological problems, are subjected to physical and psychological harassment by the common public. They also indulge in risky sexual behaviors, like they can have sexually transmitted infections, they can have HIV infection also, and they have alcohol addiction or drug addiction or drug addiction or the suicide rate of the LGBT people is due to two to three times more than general population. Then to give a direction to the medical profession, the World Medical Association have come out with a a policy statement in 2013 that homosexuality is not a disease. It is a natural variation. Listening to and behavior. monitoring your competition is likely the number one most obvious way to use your newly gained social media monitoring powers. In competitive markets, after all, it's an American absolute imperative. Think about candidates running in an election. Every word said by or about the opponent is an opportunity to strike, to differentiate, to tell the world that we can do it better. But is it really inbound? It depends on what you do Almost with that information. Inbound is a human, holistic, and helpful then approach to doing business. Be careful that you don't become so obsessive the watching the competition so that it might over-influence your strategy. So inbound is about being customer-centric, not competitor-centric. It's, it's good to know what your competitors are doing so you can better position yourself, but do it to help your customers. Now, with that out of the way, let's go over why you might monitor your competition as part of your social media monitoring activities. Well, for one, you and your competitors are innately participating in the same industry. When rising now, tides lift all boats, understanding those tides is pretty important to guiding your company's strategy. Your competitors might be more or less susceptible to a particular variable that influences them. Monitoring your competitors can help you get ahead of industry-wide changes. For example, as of 2018, companies who store data about European Union citizens needed to spend a ton of energy orchestrating their data processes and technology to support the general data protection regulation, GDPR, requirements. A number of U.S businesses thought about how this regulation impacted companies in the EU and asked, if that were to happen here in the U.S. with our customers, what would we need to do? What are those companies doing to prepare themselves? And where are they feeling the most pain? What can we learn from them? Those companies began to put new systems in place. And when the state of California implemented a new privacy law, those businesses were already set for success and positioned way ahead of their U.S.-based competition. When monitoring your competitors, take note of their wins, losses, reputation, differentiations, marketing tactics, relationships, alliances, and even their brand voice. These characteristics and how they change over time can be used to inform your own decisions. You want to use the information as part of a holistic marketing so intelligence strategy. Idea, Let's say a competitor had some kind of very public blunder. Ask yourself, if that catastrophe happened to you, wouldn't you feel like they took a cheap shot? Is this really the opportunity to go in for the kill? Is the oversight of a few of your competitors' employees really going to help differentiate your offering? In this case, the best thing to do is to simply listen to the social posts about the incident and creatively and helpfully contribute to that conversation. Don't take the opportunity to make a hard sales pitch to their customers. Just make sure those people feel as though they're being heard, especially if your competitor isn't listening. What you can do, however, is what Aviation Gin did. The exercise equipment company Peloton aired an ad during the 2019 holiday season that featured a woman who viewers saw as less enthusiastic about receiving a bike than Peloton attended. Aviation Gin, a company owned by actor Ryan Reynolds, saw that the internet was abuzz about Peloton's blender. Rather than bashing Peloton directly, Aviation Gin hired the actress in the Peloton ad and created a sequel of sorts, showcasing the woman in the ad's next steps after a year of owning the bike. They never once mentioned Peloton. It was internet gold and the video was a trending topic for days after Aviation Gin shared it on their social channels. In the first two months after the Aviation Gin ad appeared in social media, the YouTube video had over 6 million views. For a general social media monitoring business strategy, 
um, in terms of watching your competitors. It's a great way to identify what moves they might be making, making and where they may be going. For example, if your competitor starts to create social media posts around uh, the topic of automation, whereas they previously have not spoken about that, that could be a key indicator that maybe they're going to launch a new product with a key automation functionality. Um, or add automation to a current product. You might want to go back to their website and check out if they've made any updates there um, and, and prepare for that. Monitoring the competition will help your business grow and improve and hopefully sidestep some of the pitfalls that others have already experienced. The most recent hundred men with a sexual orientation problem or sexual orientation concern who came to me in the years 2018 and 2019 with a few spillover cases of 2020 and 21, a good number of people are not coming during the COVID season of this two years. Majority of the cases are in 2018 and 2019 only. Of these, 50 men with sexual activity with men are had concerned about sexual orientation, but there are heterosexuals only, which come with theater. Now, the clients with 100 out of the 100 clients with whom I dealt with, 62 men, that is, it comes into percentage also, are between 21 and 30 years of age. 32 people are between 31 and 40 years of age. This is prevalence, not incidence. Then, out of these 100 people, 48 are unmarried, and 47 are married to a woman, not to a man. And five or five men got married, but divorced because of a sexual dysfunction in him. And only two people came Let's to talk about content strategy for social media. Social media wife, is wife. nothing without the but content that makes it interesting for its users. Content truly is the backbone for all of the other activities that make up your social media plan. And having great content can make all the difference when it comes to having the best reach and engagement for your brand, which helps you build more loyalty and drive more sales. Marketers now have less than three seconds to grab attention. And the reason is because we are constantly scrolling through content. And so consumers are making decisions in a matter of seconds, uh, whether or not they want to stay with a piece of content and engage or continue to scroll and move on to the next piece of content. So it's our job as social media marketers to try to engage them and grab their attention so that we go from this to thumb stopping. If you've been marketing for a while, chances are you have a content strategy in place already. It usually includes things like your email newsletter, blog posts, your website, and downloadable content like ebooks. Social content is different. It usually serves as the vehicle to get people to those longer pieces of content or to provide smaller, digestible bits of information that help expose your brand and your values to customers and prospects. The biggest difference between social content and traditional forms of content is that social content can be read and watched in the place Places and times that people choose. There are three main reasons why people use social media. They want to be informed, entertained, and connected. Social media helps people feel informed by helping them learn new things, stay up to date on topics that matter to them, and discover new ideas and trends. And although they are concerned about the accuracy of news found online, two-thirds of Americans get their news from social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and others. Social media helps people feel entertained by helping them find and keep up with entertainers, shows, and performances, and share and consume entertaining articles and videos. It's no wonder there's such an emphasis on video content and social. Entertainment and video are key to keeping users engaged. Social media content helps people feel connected by removing many of the typical barriers of communication and allowing people to contact anyone in their personal and professional networks whenever and from wherever. Social media helps people share, comment, and take part in a global conversation that goes beyond just the people they're friends with. It's up to you to determine which type of interaction your audience is looking for and how you'll provide it to them through the content you create. Out of 100 people, 47 people are exclusively, are predominantly homosexual, 10 men are exclusively, are predominantly heterosexual. They're heterosexual. Same for homosexual concern. 
At HubSpot Academy, we talk a lot about content and about finding ways to give value to your audience on an ongoing basis through meaningful content. I'm sure you've heard the phrase that content is king. But in the world of social media, there are really two main things that matter the content and how individuals on the network interact with that content. There are a number of different types of content specific to social media, many of which can be used on the variety of channels. Let's break it down. Text used to be the mainstay of social media. Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn were pretty text-heavy channels, but in recent years, they've shifted to becoming much more visual. In fact, Cisco reports that globally, consumer internet video traffic will make up to 82% of consumer internet traffic by 2022, up from 73% in 2017. Think about that for a second and think about how much video you're doing already. Visual images include photos, infographics, animated GIFs, and illustrations. These days, you really only need a smartphone to take great photos. The possibilities are endless. Product shots, office and team highlights, conference selfies, customer spotlights, and more. You can share more than a single photo in many cases. For example, on Facebook and Instagram, you can create galleries and use photo carousels. Twitter and LinkedIn also allows for multiple photo uploads per post. Animated GIFs can take you one step beyond standard images. They can also help you demonstrate complex concepts quickly and easily, as in this example from SAP, in which they explain how AI will change the world. The upside of GIFs is that they're visual content, they're highly shareable and searchable. NASA actually uses GIFs um, on their website to show weather patterns, so there's definitely a time and a place for GIFs. But if your users aren't using GIFs, and if you're using GIFs just to get a click-through rate, that's probably not the right reason to be using them. So be really intentional about using GIFs to communicate a message and tell a story. You can make animated GIFs in Photoshop or online at a variety of sites. Giphy.com is the most popular. Video is the next big content bucket to consider. Did you know that marketers who use video grow revenue 49% faster than non-video users? Or that 59% of executives agree that if both text and video are available on the same topic, they're more likely to choose video. There is no better way to reach your customers, whether you have a service or a product, than video. You can speak to them in so many different ways. You can speak to them directly to the camera like we're doing right now. You can educate them. You can entertain them. You can tell them stories. You can convey emotions like no other media. Video is the only way to go. Video can be used on every single social media site that I've mentioned. In short, you shouldn't ignore it. Live video is also becoming more common and you can broadcast instantly from Instagram, Facebook, Periscope, which is owned by Twitter, YouTube, and a variety of channels such as Livestream. Video is not always cheap or easy to create, but you would be surprised at how often it is. Consumers appreciate brands being authentic on video, and sometimes that's easier with a smartphone than it is with an entire studio. Live video is really, really important. And because we are doing businesses with other human beings, and live video really showcases the personality of a brand. And the best part of live video is live video gives our audiences lots of agency to co-create content with a brand. And the more time our consumers are spending with our brands, the more likely they are going to do the marketing for us. So you really want to leverage live streaming to figure out a way to engage our audience, to give their voice, to share their stories, to even let them influence what we are doing as our companies or organizations. Short form video is popular these days with sites like TikTok and the Twitter owned clone of the once popular Vine app called Byte. These sites allow for very short videos of six to 15 seconds. These videos tend to be entertaining, casual, full of lip sync videos and funny stunts. That brings us to the next type of content, stories. In 2017, we saw the rise of stories. Fine tune your process. Now you know the basics of developing meaningful content for your social media audiences. We should not undertake any conversion technique, make him accept his homosexual taste. And if they ask for, we can suggest divorce from wife and treatment for the psychological problems also, and later suggest sex practices in men. So as general rule, homosexuality is not by choice, it is by birth. Homosexuality is not a disease, it is a variant sexuality. Homosexuality is a fixed 
constant orientation never changes rarely it changes in a fluid state sexual orientation cannot be changed by us our job is to make him accept his sexual orientation Let's talk about developing your strategic content plan for social media. Adopting every social channel and publishing whatever content you feel like won't deliver business results. It's when you approach your social media content strategically that you'll see the most success. Your success on social media depends on creating a sensible strategy for your content. One that fits well with your resources and your goals. This is especially important if you do not have a full-time team of social media experts at your disposal. Because with fewer resources, you'll need to be even more strategic with what you publish and on which channels. So, how do you develop a strong content strategy for social media that will bring success to your business? Let's go through a simple step-by-step -step process for developing a strategic content plan. The first step is to figure out what has worked well for you in the past. Which social media channels has your target audience engaged with the most? What types of content have performed best for views, click-throughs, and comments? Conduct a content audit of your social media channels to understand what your audience responds to best. In your content audit, look at social networks, content types, and which or your social media efforts will pay off. Thank you for a patient listening. Email and my phone number with a WhatsApp is also enclosed here with. Thank you for a patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Satya Narayana, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Attendees, uh, we have enabled the polling session for Dr. Satya Narayana's presentation, requesting you to participate in the poll, also requesting you to post your questions in chat box on presentation of Dr. Satya Narayana. Can I stop sharing, sir? Doctor, we have few questions uh, lined up. Yes, sir. Doctor, we have first question. What yes, of looking at homosexuality as a Let's talk like about tone and voice in your social media content. Is not a Here's the honest like truth. Clarified, Humanizing your brand is no longer is just an option. It's a necessity. But Humanizing your brand is a competitive edge in a highly competitive online world. People like to buy from people. They like making connections and they like to invest their time and money in people they can relate to. That's why tone and voice in your messaging are so important. Having a distinct tone and voice that reflects your values can help you connect with your audience in ways that business jargon simply can't. It, is not a it also sets you apart from other businesses it, it is not a and gets your content seen, clicked on, and engaged with. with. In other words, tone and voice turn your business into a brand. So let's back up for a second. What exactly are tone and voice? They aren't quite the same thing. Voice means the distinct and steady personality or style of your brand. For example, HubSpot Academy's voice can be described as helpful, knowledgeable, empathetic, and friendly. And that's always true, no matter what channel we're using to communicate or what situation we're communicating about. To get this voice across in social media, we create content that comes off like we're a knowledgeable and supportive friend. On this slide, you can see an example of the HubSpot Academy voice. We use positive and inclusive language that makes our followers feel comfortable and welcome, and we use clear language that reflects how human beings actually talk to one another. Essentially, HubSpot Academy creates content presenting us as helpful, supportive friends. Tone, on the other hand, is a subset of voice. It refers to the moods and attitudes of specific content pieces, which can change depending on the channel, the situation, and the audience. So while HubSpot Academy's voice is steady no matter what, our tone you, can Dr. differ from uh, post to post. Figuring out what the change. right tone is for a given post will vary do depending on your audience, your message, and of purpose. Of a social media post letting yes. your followers know that your that website is, is down will use a different tone marriage. than one announcing an exciting new product, for example. The but the voice of these posts should remain consistent no matter what. If your brand doesn't yeah, have an established voice and tone already, how do you develop that? Here are a few tips. When developing your business's voice, you'll want to think about your brand personality. If your business was a person, how would they talk? Would they be open, witty, friendly, authoritative? 
passionate, energetic, edgy. There are a lot of different descriptions you can choose from, such as these examples of voice. Choose a handful of personality words that describe your business best and reflect its values, and record them in a place where others writing marketing messaging can find them easily. When developing your business's tone, context is key. For social media in particular, think about the different scenarios that might come up and what tone you use to respond to them. See these examples of JetBlue's tone. What tone will you use when people compliment you? What tone will you use when you were responding to customer complaints? Social media for a, a B2B company versus a B2C company is different in my view because I think in a B2B, you don't have the opportunity to be as playful, to be as casual, to be as witty. Doesn't mean that you can't sometimes interject um, that into your posts. But as a B2B company, we need to be a little bit more formal, but still yet approachable. We need to be able to convey our expertise within the healthcare industry, within the data analytics space. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that the, the audience engages, feels like they're engaging in what we're saying. And because of that, I feel like we need to be a little bit more serious. When you consider the tone of a social media post, ask yourself these questions. What is the purpose of this content? Who am I writing to? How do they feel? What do they want to understand? Therefore, what kind of tone should I use? Put yourself in your audience's shoes and think about what their background, goal, and current mood might be when coming across the post. By using an established, consistent voice and tone throughout all your communications, including social media, You'll build trust with your customers because you'll feel familiar, reliable, and comfortable. Anatomical features from male and female support heterosexuality. Could homosexuality be an issue from a disturbance from a disturbance from childhood? As some research have shown, no, homosexuality is not because of a because of a childhood disturbances. I specifically told you there is no sexual abuse. Homosexuality is an inborn tendency of the person. Any sexual issues the man is subjected to in the childhood will, will make it, it make him come out. That is, he is having inside his feeling of homosexuality, but when somebody else, an elder person, provokes him for a homosexual act, the innate nature of his comes out. Nobody can make you homosexual, but they can make you realize your homosexuality. That is a disturbance in the childhood is not a reason for homosexuality. A disturbance in the childhood, suppose he got a sexual abuse from elder man, a boy having a sexual abuse by an elder man, then if at all he is homosexual, he practices homosexuality, he realizes his homosexuality. But if at all his nature is heterosexual, he hates that man who did sexual abuse on him. So childhood experiences are not at all related to the person being homosexual or heterosexual. Yes, sir. Thank you, doctor. We have uh, one more question. Yes, Provocation sir. of fulfillment of marital woes and having a family are key issues in marriage. How does homosexuality promote or negate these social values? One, one minute, sir. One minute, sir. Question from Rachel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The idea of creating okay, all the content that a social marketer needs can feel overwhelming, but it doesn't have to feel that way. Let's break down some of the things that you should consider when developing content for social. The big thing you'll want to do is to think about your overarching content strategy, which should be based on specific social media goals. Content across all the social channels should vary in a few different ways. Ideally, you'll want to optimize your content for each specific channel. To do that, it's helpful to think in terms of campaigns. That way, you're tying every post back to a bigger social goal, with the idea of developing similar related assets to use on different channels without posting identical posts on each channel. As an example, Chiquita Banana did a multi-channel campaign for the 2017 Eclipse. It includes live video shared on Facebook. A man married a woman. That is marriage, it is part. No. 
A man can marry a man. A woman can marry a woman. It may be we think that it is against nature, but homosexual man can think that heterosexuality is against nature. So it is the way which we think. So the definition of marriage, the questionnaire Dr. Rachel asked is, marriage is between man and woman only. Then that is, we have seen people, homosexual couple living together faithfully for the past 30 years. They are faithful to each other. That is, they, they, can, they don't have procreation capacity, but there are artificial techniques of producing their own children also. Yes, sir. Thank you, doctor. We have a last question. Yes, uh, during the course of this study, what are the limitations of this study? Doctor, do you want me to repeat the question? Yes, sir. During the course of your study, ah. what are the limitations of this study? So, I don't have the, that is limitations of the study is number one. The part that the suppose is a married man, married to a woman. The man comes, he never brings his wife because of shyness, because of he not having comfort zone with his wife. But I ask those people to bring their wives, but good number of the people don't want to expose themselves to their wives as homosexual, so they don't bring these wives. Suppose if the wife comes, then we'll be able to advise those people. That is the limitation. The second one, even if you confirm that this man is purely homosexual or exclusively, no, I don't say purely, there is nothing purity, it is exclusively homosexual, still we suggest it is injustice to the girl, to his married wife. We, I advise those people, don't get married before if they come to me before marriage, exclusive homosexual if they come to me before marriage i say don't get married to a woman if at all you wanted to get married get married to a man or stay bachelor if at all he is a married man then i say exclusive homosexual man to get divorced so this is a little sensitive issue in conservative societies so these are the limitations i found during the course of my practice in sex medicine in homosexuality. Thank you, doctor. Uh, can you please share your email ID in chat box so that yes. other attendees can clarify on the questions on that? Yes, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Yes. Sir. Thank moving you on. for your patient uh, listening, sir. Yeah, thank you so much, doctor. Yes, sir. Uh, attendees, we are uh, moving on to our next presentation. Dr. Vidya. Um, hello, Jeevan. Can I start? Yes, Doctor. We can be able to uh, view your screen and proceed with that. Thank you. Uh, Hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, a molecular study titled as Assessment of Quality and Quantity of DNA Extracted from Mouthwash Samples. Uh, we all are well aware that the DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is a heritage material, so it's present in almost most of the living organisms. And this is the source of most of the studies and most of our knowledge that we know. So basically in clinical medicine, forensic medicine, basic science, uh, gene therapy, and also in molecular epidemiology, biomolecular, it's used variously in various fields. Uh, we are aware that the source for this DNA can be obtained from blood samples, urine, hair samples, etc. One of the samples from where the DNA can be obtained is the buccal cells. Now, these buccal cells are a convenient source of DNA. They, um, they provide comparable results with the blood samples, which are basically the uh, go-to source for the DNA. Now, buccal cells can be either obtained from your toothbrushes or your buccal swabs or through the mouthwash samples. Now, when we look at blood samples, uh, though it is the most uh, go-to source for DNA, it also comes with certain limitations. 
we are well aware that pediatric population obtaining blood samples is quite a challenge. Uh, it is an invasive process. In genetic patients, it is going to be a bit difficult. Um, in certain people, wherein they fear the needles, such population also is quite a task. Needle prick injuries is quite a well-known uh, disadvantage for uh, collection of blood. It is expensive because we need an auxiliary personnel to collect the samples. We have to store the samples, send the samples to a uh, to a different place for the analysis. And especially when you're doing a large scale studies or molecular epidemiologic studies, where a huge population required, it is going to be expensive. So therefore, when we do a large scale or a study, we need a sample which is more comfortable to use within the Results are also equally comparable with that of blood. So therefore, buccal cells is one such source. It is easy to collect. You can get sufficient quantity similar to the blood. And it is easy to store and transport. Oxy personal are not required, which is one of the major uh, limitations with that of the blood samples. Because blood samples, we need a personal, a well-trained person to collect the samples. But in buccal cell samples, uh, we ask this can collect the samples. And it is... Uh, uh, it is simply uh, simplifies repeated sample collection. Whenever we take blood cell samples, because of certain technical issues, we have to again redo the sampling in blood cells. Uh, but in buccal cell samples, it's very easy to collect the samples again, which is an added advantage. Curating so content for your social media channels is a great way to consistently DNA, stay active on each channel with less content, demonstrate to industry thought leadership, the and, and to build a community, DNA, all while saving time. So what is content what curation? Content curation means gathering content that's relevant to a particular topic or area of interest and then sharing it with your audience. It doesn't mean passing off someone else's content as your own. So make sure you're linking back to the original author's content and giving them credit for creating something that was so good you wanted to share it with your community. So, why should you include content curation in your social strategy? For one, content curation saves time and money. You know as well as we do that creating your own content takes a lot of time. But when you turn to your community to see what they're sharing and what they're writing about that relates to your own business, you'll discover an entire world of existing content and ideas that you can share on your own channels. Secondly, content curation builds industry connections. When you shine light on other people's work by retweeting them or linking to their blog posts, you're showing them that you appreciate their content and you think it's worthy of sharing, which is a great way to build your network. Building industry connections through content curation can also help you extend your social reach. Let's say I'm a really big fan of a certain brand. If I find that your brand posts content from the brand I like so much, then I might check out your brand to see what you're all about. This will lead to increased social influence too. Sharing curated content also enables you to post a bigger variety of content. So let's say your own brand tends to publish and share a lot of blog content. The resulting DNA isolator was subjected to uh, spectrophotometry to determine the optical density. And then for furthermore, application of DNA was done by PCR and documented using gel electrophoresis. And here, PAX9 gene was used, which is a low molecular weight gene. Coming results, uh, spectrophotometric analysis. Uh, when here, when we uh, optical density of uh, various diameters of samples, we extracted DNA from almost all the samples, but the 30 day samples, the extraction of DNA was a task. Uh, among the 10 samples, the 10 samples of the 30 day samples, six samples showed a very small pellet, and the remaining four samples did not show in the, any pellet at all. There was complete absence of it. So, due to technical difficulties, this complete group was excluded from the analysis. So, only immediate 10 and 20 day samples were considered. The yield was good in 10 day samples compared to 20, uh, 10, sorry, the yield was good in the initial samples compared to the 10 and the 20 day samples. 10 day samples showed a decrease by 16%, while 20 day samples showed a decrease by 22% from the immediate samples. The immediate samples were successfully amplified, while 10 and 20 day samples were unable to show the documentation in Agaro's gel. Here we had extract, uh, we had amplified for the PAX9 gene. So here, um, basically, more samples uh, are widely used comparatively to the buckle swabs because studies have shown that the yield that you get with more samples is 16 to, is compared to that of the 16 38 buckle swabs. And also here, uh, we used a sucrose solution, which is more uh, palatable and it is easy to rinse compared to the um, 
uh, mouthwash samples which are present in market rice. Now, application of samples was done with Paxanine, which is a low amount of weight gene. Uh, here, we have to note that these samples are immediate samples, and they show the amplification here. Specific amplification was noted. So, all the samples were present in equatorial region, and they were farther away from the marker. This marker was a high amount of weight marker, whereas the Paxanine lower gene from which we wanted the specific application to happen was a low amount of weight. So, we can note that everything was an equilo equilo uh, equatorial placement. Specific application was carried out and the farther away from the marker, suggesting that the particular application that we wanted it was successful to happen. Uh, we are well aware that uh, by freezing, DNA activity is not going to be affected. Metabolical activity will be arrested, but it will be viable. But on room temperature, whenever we try to store DNA in room temperature, because of uh, susceptible to instability, decay, degradation, contamination, fragmentation, damage, all these are going to happen. Therefore, the yield of DNA may not be that good when you do on a room temperature. So this could be the reason why the 10 and 20 day samples could not provide the amplification, though the extraction was successful. Uh, the entire stretch of the particular sequence that we want to amplify here was Pax9 gene. So that particular sequence could have been cleaved into bits. And therefore, this uh, amplification was not possible in the 10 and 20 day samples, though the extraction was successful. So the aim of the study was met as we could successfully isolate DNA from buccal cells obtained from mouthwashes. Moreover, we could determine the optical density and amplification for a particular sequence was possible, which is Pax9 low motor weight gene here. Uh, we do find various studies in, in support of the present study. Desha Colors et al. found the mouthwash samples produced consistently better results than the brushes. Ping et al. concluded that they were equivalent for PCR reaction requiring immediate DNA fragmentation, but the mouthwash work was far more superior for uh, reactions requiring long fragments. Kozir et al. compared cheek swabs and mouthwash for buccal cells collection in the Black Woman Health Study and concluded that the mouthwash was superior in terms of success of PCR and DNA aid. Studies have also shown that mouthwash method has been validated in mass screening with PCR applications for specific mutations with specificity and sensitivity of 100%. Our findings were also consistent with Heather Spencer Pilsen et al. In this study, they showed that 10 and 30 day samples had significant DNA than those processed after bonding. Also, Hain et al. showed in their study that DNA could be extracted at different temperatures. And here they have extracted at 25 and 37 degrees also. And for a maximum of one week with less of PCR failures. Alam and Lee Merchant et al. reported that storage of unprocessed samples at room temperatures for one week did not affect the DNA or ability to PCR amplify. Gracia Colors et al. found that storage at minus 80 degrees centigrade for up to one year did not significantly deplete the amount of DNA in the samples. So here we see a different temperature ranges, which support that until 10 days maximum, predominantly was sufficient enough for the DNA to be extracted when stored at room temperatures. But however, in contrast, we found certain studies wherein that Ellen H. M. et al. and Marcy Ajar, they were not able to extract the DNA for a period of two weeks and 30 days respectively. Uh, we have to note that here, um, and they were able to extract with their animal to extract. They have to note that we come from a tropical climate because the study was done in India. So therefore, the lab equipment and the temperature definitely does vary and therefore this can act as a limitation when we're when we're trying to store the samples. DNA tests are being developed to recover information from smaller regions of DNA, which are more likely to be intact following DNA damage. These new DNA tests include many SDRs using PCR primers close to the SGR repeat region and single nucleotide polymorphisms. Whole genome amplification and DNA repair methods are also being evaluated to determine the possibility of enriching PCR amplification material from limited or damaged DNA templates. This improved technology will definitely enhance those cleave bits that uh, we had lost in 1020 samples to amplify the DNA in those samples too. For the directions, uh, we were able to extract DNA until the immediate extraction was possible and 10 days extraction was possible, though we saw a dip in the amount of the yield of DNA. So therefore, um, as for, for the size that required to require DNA isolation application from immediate to seven days duration at an everyday interval to arrive at a conclusion for a period of maximum DNA yield. Conclusion, multiple samples provide sufficient quantity of DNA which can be utilized for mass biological studies. Therefore, this appears to be a simple procedure which is non-invasive. 
which is likely to increase participation and decrease costs in morphological studies and can be alternated to blood samples. Are my references? Thank you. Dr. Vidya? Yes. Uh, now I request the participants to raise queries to Dr. Vidya. The polls have been enabled. Participants can start voting for Vidya. I request the participants to raise queries to Vidya so that she'll be answering. Grace, uh, if you have any queries, we can see you are lifting the hands up there. Ms. Vidya, we have one question from one of our participants. Yes, yes. Uh, I see Ari that. Is it uh, this remote tissue from a child without the knowledge of the mother? For genetic testing for paternity of crime. Yes, it is. Um, DNA material is definitely something which cannot be done without a consent. Therefore, we have to take consent if we're going through legal uh, methods. We do see certain cases coming up, but uh, it is actually extraction of DNA because it has genetic material, it is legally, if there is legality possibilities in that. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Uh, we have to know that DNA is genetic material, and when genetic material is the source for almost the foundation of a living organism, right? So, you have, when you are extracting DNA from any possible sources, it if you if the person is aware that it's been done, it's better to always take a consent because legality there is definitely a problem. We have one more question from Rachel. So what are the legal structures around taking tissues without consent from the person? Uh, the legal structures can be that the person definitely can sue you. The first thing because most of people, they are Google aware about the importance of genetic material and DNA and what all can be obtained from them. Now, once you have a DNA, the, num the numerous possibilities that you can do with it is enormous can alter, you can change, you can do so many things with it. But you can, the vaccines are created, or you can have an alteration, you have the entire genetic makeup of a person. So it is a huge uh, legal problem. It is not something that easy. There's a subject branch in science and legality and the crime sections, everything for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vidya. So there's one more question. Yeah, yeah, definitely there are ethical issues. Um, see, genetic material differs from person to person, and certain com certain offsprings, certain ethical races will have certain similarities within them. That's the reason we, we are able to differentiate them into different ethical groups. Um, so all of these will definitely come under legality issues. 
without knowledge doing anything or without a consent doing profiling this is definitely common issue that for you always when you take a blood sample or any sample you always give a consent form thank you so much doctor i need to put your email id in the chat box so that the participants would be benefited out of it Now I request Alphonse to present the paper on assessment of infection prevention and control practices in health facilities in Cameroon using the co-infection prevention and control assessment framework. Is the Alphonse? Can you please on your video? Yes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. You're clear. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? No. No. Yes. Yes. Can you make it as a slideshow? Yes. Is that okay? No, Mr. Alphonse. Yes, now it's fine. Now it's fine. You're good to go. Thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity to present uh, this work. So uh, I'm called Alphonse Achu. I'm Cameroonian, and uh, I'm a field epidemiologist working in the Ministry of Public Health. Um, and I also happen to work, I uh, happen also to be a PhD candidate in public health. And this is part of my uh, thesis work that I'm sharing with you today. So we are going to be seeing what happens or the, the results of the assessment of infection prevention and control in health facilities in Cameroon. We uh, use the WHO uh, IPC assessment framework. So we are going to follow this uh, outline, this presentation outline. I'm going to give you a little background on, on the topic, the problem, the method that we use and results and conclude and I will conclude and give you the next steps of the work. So uh, healthcare children infections uh, are defined as infections acquired during delivery of care and they constitute actually a global challenge with developing countries disproportionately affected. Uh, WHO actually reports that uh, up to 7% of patients in developed countries and 10% in developing countries will acquire at least one healthcare associated infection. And so uh, the annual hospital cost for healthcare associated infections in the US actually estimated at $33 billion per year. This is really huge. And however, in developing countries, we, it is very difficult to estimate this. Uh, the cost uh, WHO, the recent WHO report actually states that uh, costs attributable to healthcare associated infections are poorly uh, documented and they vary uh, in developing countries. And so one key thing is that uh, infection prevention and control programs, especially health facilities at the national level, but also at uh, health facilities is vital to limit the spread, the spread of healthcare associated infections. And uh, I want to share with you the, 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 the core components of an infection prevention and control program. Uh, according to WHO, we have eight yeah, components at the health facility level. So we have one, the existence of a program. That is, we, we need to have a program, we need to have a, a, a documentation that uh, this release a program with an organigram of how the program is supposed to be run. We need to have IPC guidelines. We need to have people who are trained and uh, educated in infection prevention. That's WHO calls them champions who are supposed to champion the cause of IPC in health facilities. They need to be uh, surveillance of healthcare associated infections. And then they, use, they need to use a multimodal strategy. This strategy is actually a four steps uh, to five step strategy where you need to, first of all, if you want to change behavior, the very first thing you need to do, it doesn't suffice to educate somebody, but you need to, first of all, change the environment. 
that is you need to put in place uh, uh, for, for, for instance, if I take IPC, you need to put in place uh, gels, soap, water points for people to wash hands. You need to improve on that. You need to train the people. You have to do monitoring to ensure that the practice, you need to motivate them so that they can change behavior. That's what WHO calls multimodal strategy. But also you need to do monitoring and audit feedbacks using the, the WHO has actually, they actually developed a tool for this. You also need to evaluate the workload to be, to be ensure to ensure that uh, workers are not overworked at the level of health facilities and also look at staffing and bed occupancy. You need okay. to also look but at- Not as many videos. If you can curate and share some really great videos instance, from other brands alongside your own blog posts, hygiene, you'll be uh, giving your audience more variety. Up, uh, so they aren't just seeing the same types of stuff from you time and time again. So we do like to share, um, whether it's a retweet or if we're co-hosting an event on Facebook, um, if we're, we leave comments on Instagram, we really like that interaction. Um, if it's something that we feel per, perhaps an author or another bookstore has said it better, um, we want to share that voice and you know just let them speak it. If it's already been done perfectly, we, we don't want to try and, and change that in any way. Um, but for us, it is also part of building relationships. It's, it's that interaction action, whether it's with a community member, you know, a customer, or if it's uh, an illustrator who's happened to stop by and is trying to promote their work. Um, we really do try to just pick things up as they come. We don't plan any retweets or, you know, any reposting, um, but if it comes up and we feel like it's definitely worth saying and, and worth getting out to an even bigger audience, we're more than happy to try and, and help that along. Speaking of variety, if you're sharing content from others, then your social feeds are going to appear more diverse to someone scrolling through. For example, I know that your brand not only publishes quality content that you create, but that you also publish industry news and other quality content in the industry, that I'm going to start looking to you as someone who really knows what they are talking about. That's right. Content curation well, shows your diverse IPC knowledge as a thought leader. I'll see you as the kind of brand that posts on social to create value for your audience, not IPC just to promote your own brand. So what are some tips to curating content effectively? First of all, make sure you establish a good mix of promotional content and curated content. People get tired of brands endlessly promoting their own products, which is exactly why progressive brands think beyond products and features. The relationship customers have with brands today goes beyond the product itself. So when you're posting on social media, we recommend an 80-20 mix. Only 20% of your social media content should promote your own brand. The other the other 80% should be dedicated to content that really, truly interests your audience, engages them in conversations. For the most part, curated content will belong in that 80%. Try to be consistent with how many times you publish curated content versus your own content on a day-to-day -day basis too. To figure out what content you should actually curate, keep your buyer persona in mind. What industry thought leaders do they admire? Which publications do they trust to stay up to date on industry news? What other brands that aren't your direct competitors, do they follow and want to hear from? Use surveys and other methods to understand your customers. The best thing to do is to get on the phone with some of your customers who represent an ideal buyer and ask them who they follow and who they want to hear from on social. Knowing who your audience is interested in learning from will give you some great ideas for whom to keep track of and curate content from. Pulling from a consistent set of sources will also help you save time, but make sure you spread out the posts from the same sources. There are a few content curation tools out there that can make things easier. I've included a list of good ones here. Make sure you screenshot it and check them out for yourself. Before you choose the content curation tool you will use, make sure you really understand the role content curation will play in your social media strategy. Strategy. A one-person marketing team should start simple. Begin with a free option. And then as your business and team grow, content curation may play a larger role and require more powerful software. By now, you should have a solid understanding of the role content curation can play in helping you demonstrate industry leadership, post consistently, and build a community across all your social channels. And then we have a median score. Uh, of 225.5. That is keep putting the, the, the on a range. That is the lowest. The, 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 we had one facility with the lowest score of 113 on a scale of 800. And uh, the, uh, the highest was 530, so 800. So that was the range. And uh, keeping or classifying these health facilities under uh, basic, if we go by the median. 
And most uh, of these health facilities were either inadequate or basic. They had a basic or inadequate level of infection prevention and control. And so uh, healthcare associated infection surveillance was the weakest component of all the components, of all of the eight components evaluated. That is, none of the health facilities had an advanced level of uh, infection prevention, according to the report. And so we go also by public versus private, and we go by, uh, the cat we categorize also by reference, regional, district, and health facilities are the classes of, of uh, health facilities that we, we, we surveyed. And then we go by the IEPC status also, you would see, like I said, that most of them were either inadequate or basic. So what does that mean? If you look at the classification here, on a scale of 800, if you have from zero to 200, you are classified as inadequate. You have a lot of work to do. From 200 to 400 or 201 to 400 is basic, 401 to 600 is intermediate and 601 to uh, 800 is advanced as according to double so we looked at uh, a public uh, the, uh, the level of ipc and so none of the health facility sample had uh, an advanced ipc like i said now we we dare to use sky square to look a little bit to play to look a little bit at uh, association chinese categorical data and uh it suffice to say that there was a significant association between regional location and having a health facility with an intermediate level, which is which was the highest level. This uh, we are not affirmative of uh, affirmative of this. It might be because the sample size was small. We intend to improve on this, add the sample size, and see whether this uh, assertion could be valid. Uh, but it doesn't also rule it out because we also know that there are some regions that are uh, that are more developed than others in Cameroon. So that also can explain this. And so uh, IPC status to conclude is that IPC status is poor in Cameroon. Generally, in Cameroonian health facilities, the use of this tool is not common. None of the health facilities that we sample have ever used this tool before. This was surprising to us too. So this, uh, there is need to advocate for the use of this tool, which is a very important tool, especially in the advent of the COVID pandemic. I know that when Cameroon notified its first uh, case of COVID in March 2020, then the tool that they started using, which was an emergency tool or an adapted tool, was a scorecard. I don't know whether it is used in other countries, but that's what we use in Cameroon. And we use that in Cameroon, and which is a, a, a summarized version, a summarized version of this. But still, we need this IPC to do baseline uh, assessments and even follow-up assessments. And so these are references, and I'm going to tell you the next step in my research work. So we want to, first of all, advocate, and we have been doing that already, advocate for the use, because we've shared these results with uh, the hierarchy. We are advocating for the use of this tool to improve uh, IPC practices in all health facilities in Cameroon, especially given the COVID pandemic. And uh, the next step would be for us to design and implement a continuous uh, quality improvement of IPC in pilot health, health facilities. That's the next step of my work. I've, I'm already working. I've already chosen some, uh, uh, some pilot health facilities from this 38 where I am implementing quality improvement. I'm doing uh, uh, repeated assessments with this tool. I want to see, to see whether what are the challenges and how can we advise the government on how to go about it? And so I'm particularly interested uh, in designing and adapting a healthcare associated infection surveillance in, in these pilot health facilities. To so know that this is a challenge in developing countries. We do not even have uh, data, or there is a lot of scarcity, there is scarcity of data in developing uh, countries and especially in Cameroon. And so once we develop and this, and test it and test they will develop and test a framework where that we can market or that we can propose to policymakers where they can use to improve especially this arm that was the weakest 
in our study. With that, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you for listening. Over. I'm available if there are any clarifications or questions or if there are comments to improve the work. Thank, Thank you so you much, uh, Mr. Alphonse, for the topic presenter in the medicine uh, theme. Uh, dear participants, please raise question in the Q&A box so that uh, we can answer, uh, we can ask uh, Mr. Alphonse to answer on that. And side by side, we open the poll for uh, Mr. Alphonse to uh, get the scores in the polling session. So we have received one uh, one question in the chat box. What do you think can be used to improve on the IPC status in terms of materials? Thank you for your for this very important question. I think that in terms of uh, uh, materials, we will only follow the the WHO guidelines. I think the WHO guidelines are clear. The one thing we discovered, the uh, one thing we discovered in uh, our, in, the, in our survey, is that this tool was not yet vulgarized. Many people didn't know about it. They didn't. They had never heard about it. It was their first time of hearing about this tool that could be used to improve infection prevention. And, uh, and control. And so for us, the very first thing would be to vulgarize or to sensitize the health facilities on the use of this tool, especially given the, the present context, which is what we are already uh, doing. And then the next thing will be supervisions, on-site supervisions to ensure that people use this. I wouldn't say that uh, the government should uh, uh, print this and say, no, the health facilities have the capacity to just to download this, print it out, and then use it, and then train the people to how to and how to, to fill it. In the health facilities that we, in our continuous uh, quality improvement uh, design, we, 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 we have actually, we are actually testing a, a, met, a methodology where there are different steps on how to go about this with the, with the, with the use of this material. Uh, thank you for answering, uh, Mr. Alphonse. Can you share your email ID in the chat box so that if anybody having any queries or concerns, they can contact you directly? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And you can unshare your screen as well as your video can be disconnect and make yourself as a participant for continue this uh, uh, eight TWCS conference. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Next, we have uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Parimala Mohanty, public health doctoral research scholar, IMS and some hospital, Odisha, India. I welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Parimala Mohanty is a public health doctoral research scholar from IMS and some hospital, Siksha, O, Ashudan demand to be a university, Bhuvaneshwar and Odisha, India. She has four years of experience in the field of health with an effective leadership skills, enthusiasm in teaching, and great intent in research activities. She currently works in the domain of geriatric nutrition. She was a research per person for training program on dementia care and management for functionaries of home for senior citizens by National Institute of Social Defense. Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. Also a resource person in the workshop at National Workshop at a basic biostatics using SPSS at IMS and some hospital. She also serves as a reviewer at International Journal for Equity in Health. As recognition for her outstanding and excellent academic records, she had been awarded gold medal by governor during her bachelor's studies and batch report, batch topper in her master of public health course. She was awarded with a cash prize at New York Consortium of Universities for Global Health Conference for essay on global reflection. She is a member of International Epidemiological Association, Epidemiology Foundation of India, like member of Indian Red Cross Society, and involved in several voluntary activities. I welcome you, ma'am. And Dr. Parimla Mohanty is going to present a topic under uh, the medicine scheme, concepts of validity and reliability of measurement tools in primary research with example from on my ongoing doctoral study. Dr. Parimla, please. 
Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. You are yes. very audible and your video is visible here. And kindly share your screen so that everyone can view the presentation, ma'am. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and for the invitation. I'm glad to be speaking in your conference. So here I share my presentation. Sure, please. Your screen is visible now. Please uh, click on the slideshow button. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you click on slideshow button, it will be maximized. The screen will be enlarged. You can see the uh, on the bottom right hand side. Yeah, it is in uh, slideshow mode. Yeah. Okay. Please continue, ma'am. Okay. So a good afternoon to all the participants. Today I am going to uh, share the concept of validity and reliability in primary research. So let's start with the topic validity and reliability concept. What it is exactly. Validity and reliability are used to evaluate quality of research. They indicate how well a method, test or tool measures something. Validity is the accuracy of a measure. Reliability is about the consistency of a measure. So while uh, doing a primary research, we need a tool to uh, collect data for our research. So in order to have a qualitative, qual proper quality of research, we need to ensure that our tool, uh, the instrument which we are using to collect the data are valid and reliable. Validity is the extent to which a test measures what it's supposed to measure. There are several ways to estimate the validity of a test, including content validity, construct validity, criteria validity, and phase validity. Then types of validity, external validity, internal validity, content validity. In external validity, it occurs when the causal relationship discovered can be generalized to other people time and context correct sample will allow generalization and hence give uh, external validity in case of internal validity it can be conducted uh, there is a causal relationship between the variables being studied it is sorry, to, sorry to interrupt uh, dr parimala now yeah. your slide is not moved it's in the front uh, introduction slide only okay can you click on f5 key in the keyboard press f5 yeah in Is the bottom good? in the bottom you have uh, the slideshow button ma'am nearby the slider zoom Press F, F9. Or is, it, is it moving? No, ma'am. It's moving, but it's not in a slideshow mode. So the entire uh, PowerPoint window is showing. Can you click on the slideshow menu, ma'am? In the top home, insert design, animation, slideshow. Can you click on the slideshow menu, please? One second. Just give me a second. Okay. From the beginning, from beginning, please. Click on the first one. No, no, not one. From beginning, the first icon. Yeah. Okay, so I was here with the validity. Okay, so I'm continuing with this slide. It's not showing actually, it's not working, I think so. So you can. Is it not yet visible? I'm really extremely sorry for the technical glitch. I don't know why such thing is happening. So can we continue with this? Uh, I think this is moving. Yeah, yeah, it's moving, ma'am. You can continue with this, sorry. 
Yeah, yeah. Sorry for the technical glitch. Absolutely sorry. I don't know what's wrong. Okay. It's okay, ma'am. Please continue. Please. Okay, okay, okay. So types of validity. They are external validity, internal validity, and content validity. In case of external validity, uh, when the causal relationship discovered can be generalized to other people, time, context. Correct sampling allows generalization and hence give external validity. In internal validity, when it can be concluded that there is a causal relationship between the variables being studied, it is related to the design of the experiment. And in case of content validity, when we want to find out if the entire content is represented in the test, we compare to the test with the content of the behavior. This is, this is a logical method, not an empirical one. Example, if we want to test knowledge in Indian geographical setup, it is not fair to have questions limited to geography of New England or some other country. We need to contextualize to the setup in which we are going to conduct the research. And uh, face validity. Then the tool needs to be validated from the participants. So that is face validity. Then test validity. In construct validity. In case of construct validity, we have different section of the tools and we need to see that the construct of each of the uh, uh, tool matches with each other. So this is a schematical diagram in which it is shown like validity, uh, how many types it is, internal validity, external validity, then uh, how we need to do a content validity, then face validity, then construct validity. And uh, test valid in case of external validity, we need to have population validity, ecological validity, test validity, criterion validity, concurrent validity, and predictive validity. So coming to reliability, reliability is like we are seeing over time that our tool is giving the same measures. So for that, we need to do test retest. In case of test retest reliability is the degree to which the scores are co consistent over time. It indicates score variation that occurs from testing session to testing session as a result of error of measurement. So that we can see that is there any error in our tool that once we are testing and uh, again when we retest using that tool the findings are same or different. So it is like same test at different times. Then equivalence reliability. So the association of answer to set of question designed to measure the same concept. This is basically a statistical measure in that we use convex alpha to measure the inter item reliability, which is based on average of all the possible correlation of all the split one by twos of set of question on a questionnaire. So that we can see if there is internal consistency between different question. A set of questions belong to one bunch of question. Then parallel fault reliability. In, in case of a research where multiple interviewers are there and you have a multiple, uh, you need uh, especially appropriate when the test is very long, the most commonly used method is to split the test into two using odd even strategy. Since longer test tends to be more reliable and since split half reliability represents the reliability of a test only half as long as the uh, actual test. Inter-observer reliability corresponds between measures made by different observers. Like two observers are seeing the same thing and having same finding. So this is the schematical diagram showing the types of reliability. Uh, test retest, inter-term rel uh, reliability, parallel forms, inter-observer arrangement. Then what are the what is the relationship between validity and reliability? Validity and reliability are very closely related to each other. A test cannot be considered valid unless the measurement resulting from it is reliable. Likewise, a result from a test can be reliable and not necessarily valid. Like, uh, I would like to share an example. Like a thermometer, uh, if, we, uh, if we are measuring, it is showing the same uh, um, temperature multiple times when we are measuring. So it can be said it is reliable. But uh, when we are seeing it uh, and the result is two degree less from the actual, so it is not valid. 
so maybe a tool may give us a uh, reliable result but it may not be valid so reliability and validity gives a strength to our research so coming to the concept of validity and reliability with example from my ongoing doctoral study the study title is dietary pattern and its association with health status of older people a study from odisha india so basically this study looks into the dietary pattern and the health outcomes of older adults so two components are there so for developing the so to address the objective of the research study um, a tool development process was initiated in the tool development process initially a exploratory study was started uh, then validity and this was the schematic uh, diagram of the development of instrument process like first exploratory survey then we did the validity and reliability then finally instrument was piloted in a small scale and then it was used for the research purpose exploratory survey in case of exploratory study uh, survey that i conducted the data from the exploratory survey were collected from older adult from household living in bhubneshwar odisha mm, so the questionnaire used in the exploratory survey contained four section like we did a literature review we searched for different tools which are available to collect this data then we went to field to see how people what are their perception and we made a pre questionnaire finalization Uh, exercise then after uh, during this uh, pre questionnaire finalization session the process included an exhaustive literature review to extract related items then followed by an interview schedule and focus group discussion to understand cultural uniqueness along with having a free flow idea from the study participants the discussion was open non leading and lively debate intended to know regarding the prospective about dietary patterns eating habit and food preference then the exploratory study helped to determine the factors that are affecting the adoption and non adoption of food behaviors lot of constructive proposition came up with this exercise the questionnaire was modified in order to include the crucial missed point the questionnaires were refined again and concreted then proceeded to the next stage of phase validity uh this is a this is a picture that i'm showing uh, regarding phase validity in phase validity the degree to which the measures appear to be appropriate to the study purpose and related to construct in the judgment of non expert such as the representative of study participants the study participants were asked if they are able to understand the questionnaire or they are uh, it is uh, uh in the process of evaluating the appearance of the questionnaire in terms of visibility readability consistency of style formatting and the clarity of the language used was seen in this phase validity in phase validity it is subjectively assessed regarding the relevance of the measuring instrument as to whether the item in the instrument appear to be relevant relevant reasonable unambiguous and clear in order to examine the face validity dichotomous scale can be used with categorical option yes and no which indicated favorable and unfavorable item like if they are able to understand or not yes or no in that format data was collected then sec uh, we went for expert validity the question framework established was sent to nine purposely chosen expert to review the draft questionnaire to ensure if it was consistent with the conceptual framework each reviewer independently rated the relevance of each item using a four point likert scale like if the questionnaire according to the expert if the questionnaire is relevant uh, somewhat relevant relevant very relevant so they have to mark the questions according to this experts the content validation index was used to estimate the validity of the item then construct validity to find the degree to which the item on the questionnaire related to the relevant theoretical construct it is a quantitative value rather than a qualitative distinction between valid and invalid for this we did factor analysis it is the statistical method to be used to cluster items into common factors 
interpreted each factor according to the items having high loading on it and summarized the item into a small number of factors. Like it was grouping the question of similar type into one construct. Then uh, for reliability, we did a reliability test, examined the ability of the question to consistently measure the attribute and how well the item fits together. So uh, internal consistency, it examines the inter-item correlation within an instrument and indicates how well the item fits, fits together. Then we did test retest. It will, uh, it will be estimated by administering the same tool to the same people on two different occasions. So in our case, we took a difference of two months on the assumption that there will be no substantial changes in the construct under study between two sampling time points or it will be estimated by administrating our tool and another standard tool. In some cases, people use different standard tools. Like in our case, so we were we are estimating- To get uh, the best pattern. region results so on social media. We food frequency questionnaire. So uh, once we used food frequency questionnaire, the other time we used 24 hours diet re uh, recall method. So these are two different and we can check if the uh, result are similar or different. Then after all this, uh, the social final stage of the instrument development you process your social media was the pilot test of the questionnaire using making it easier to coordinate whose background are similar to our study population that your social media address were taken. The and uh, the, the instrument was content piloted. repository. So this is the basically a summary of the whole uh, validation and uh, reliability of the instrument of our questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire is OAS HD questionnaire. Preliminary survey was done based on social literature media and calendar. local well, you uh, survey. Your social media then validity far process advanced. for validity Making procedure we did uh, translational validity that is content and validity from social media marketing. Uh, export Template and face validity from study participants. Repository and then uh, we did construct validity. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And and Uh, test retest was done to establish the reliability of our tool. How you can use it to plan your then monthly social media content. Then finally, questionnaire key of the forward and backward translation. Might want to coordinate. And piloting. Feel free to change this key questionnaire. depending on the types of content that you tend to promote. This is the question guide. It has four You'll sections. You'll also see that you can write in the date next to you. or above uh, each day of the week. Then the questionnaire the was below, converted. The questionnaire is developed and translated into content or campaign.